you know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swollen like six. Did it perfect in the kick. Got a feeling I'm sick of my hate. I'm nothing better. Put on the rubber, just win. I've been working a million dollars. The devil that shit ain't achieve it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the sixth part of What If Deku Helps His Best Friend, Peter Parker. Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Where is he? Where is Peter? Called out a female voice, and Yaga's blood froze. On instinct he jumped to his feet just as the door to the nurse's office exploded. This day couldn't get any worse, Mount Lady thought. At home, she burned her tongue with a cup of coffee that was too hot. At work, she got Shinji riding her for getting a friggin' scan upside down on a scanner. On patrol, she dropped her guard, being unable to transform due to some muscle dickhead of a villain holding a family hostage after a bank robbery. Just when she thought the rest of the day would be a breeze, even if there was not many thugs around to bag and tack. She got the phone call from the nurse's office while just returning to the agency with some ramen from a local Korean fusion joint. 2,000 yen gone to waste when she dropped the bowl, but she didn't care. Take Yama Yu sped from downtown to UA, trying to call Nimiri Senpai but Midnight hadn't replied. She stopped bothering after she made it to the parking lot and sprinted towards UA. S front gate, which was closed off courtesy of blast doors. She took advantage of her being a pro to avoid the media packs and she noticed Chief Fukuda Botten at the entrance to the UA. Campus guiding his force like a maestro performing Beethoven at the London Philharmonic. She's never seen an opera, but considering how much chaos there was, Fukuda was excelling and when they locked eyes, she noticed how his face went pale. He said something and the iron doors opened up. The blonde sprinted through the offered opening, giving a single thank you on her way past. For once she ignored the calls from the media, running for all that she was worth. The front doors of UA barely even slowed her down, neither did her pivot as she turned down the hall, memory guiding her to where the nurse's office was. She kept up the pace for as long as she could, her legs and lungs were burning, but she saw the door. Where is he? Where is Peter? She yelled, getting to the door and slamming it open. Her normally conditioned and smooth platinum blonde hair a mess as she panted, looking around. Ah, Takeyama, you came much faster than I anticipated, recovery girl said from her desk. Yu's eyes looked past her, past the skinny man standing in front of the other cot and her heart became like ice as she ran towards him. Peter was in bed in a gown, needles and IVs strapped to him as his gown no doubt covered the worst of the damage. Even then he had a breathing mask over his face, his eyes closed. She stood at his side, taking his hand and giving it a tight squeeze. I'll be outside, the skinny man said. You heard the door open and close, but her eyes never left Peter, her ward. The ward she told, she promised that nothing bad was gonna happen to him. What happened? She asked, her voice shaky as she turned towards recovery girl. Chiyo closed her eyes. I know Parker got hurt in an attack, but it didn't make sense. How did Peter end up like this? How? With his abilities and gear. This was the last thing she expected. The unforeseen simulation joint was attacked by a group calling themselves the League of Villains, who were planning to kill All Might. Recovery Girl stated, Parker protected his friends from the villains and she sighed, and you understood. Don't worry, the fact is, Takeyama, he's going to make it. She got out of her chair and walked towards the taller woman with her cane. But I have questions for you. What do you need? Just some answers. Recovery Girl said, you're Parker's guardian, so can you tell my why he's been sleep deprived? You stiffened as the nurse turned towards her computer, the MRIs on display. You wasn't the best at the medical side of her job, but even she could tell that something was wrong with the scan. Did you notice anything strange about his behavior before today? Use mind flashback to the night before, why yes, and I'm sorry I just found out. You didn't notice until today too, came a voice, and you perked up seeing the green-haired kid lying in the bed across from Peter. She was so focused on her charge she didn't notice the super plain kid. She nodded, we talked last night. He's been having nightmares. Nightmares? That explains a little. Chiyo muttered. His brain is overworked, taxed with stress and trying to keep up. Nightmares can do that to a person. She sighed. You opened and closed her mouth, a hand resting against the pole at the end of Peter's bed for support. I, I didn't know he. He was always fine. Then last night, her voice trailed off. The talk was burned into her memory and the implications that came with it. Peter, you started, gently caressing his hair, what he went through to get to Japan, I barely know half the story, 
but he. She stopped, barely managing to speak through the lump in her throat. She knew he lost a fight, coming over from an entirely different world. By default, he has lost some of his family from his old world right. He lost a lot in his life. He you bit her lip. She didn't know much, but he had to have lost something. Someone lost a villain after a fight in the US, and it was the reason he had to live with me. He has no one left. I was an acquaintance of his family so. Here we are. You heard the plain boy gasp and saw Chio shuffling over to her side. The small woman said nothing, simply looking at the boy with new understanding. I thought I helped by giving him support, but you stopped when she felt Chio take her free hand in hers. Chio offered her a warm smile, even though Yu's red eyes were getting redder with tears. He'll be alright, Takeyama, she promised. You whipped her eyes, I know, I just... You've done enough, Takeyama, Chio consoled. Despite what you think, you did well to look after him. I still didn't notice, you whispered dejectedly. I'm his guardian, his parent basically, and I... Don't blame yourself, you weren't the only one. The faculty didn't notice until it was too late. Chio said, All we can do is learn from our past mistakes. And more forward. You nodded, and she hugged Chio. Thank you, Auntie. She uttered with a sob, remembering Recovery Girl's preferred nickname for them in private when she used to be an assistant nurse under her at UA. For extra credit. And here she was, taking care of you years after she left these halls. In a way, she was the closest thing she had to an auntie. Not like her family did much for her then. Chiyo smiled warmly, her eyes and aura full of maternal love, embracing her hug as her frail hand caressed the back of Yu's head. There there, Yu sniffled, biting her lip as she rose to her full height. I may not have children, but considering all the young ones who walk through these halls, they might as well be considered my own, even those who have graduated and started families of their own. Now, Chiyo said, breaking the hug, I want you to know that Parker will be up and running in a few days. He needs rest, and after what he's been through, the young man deserves it. Recovery girl stated as she picked up her cane. If anything comes up, you'll be the first to know. I know the best hospital director here in Musutafu myself. He'll let you in, and the moment he's better, just sign some paperwork and he's out. My quirk will have him as good as new. Yes dot 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 yes dot dot I. She looked back at Peter, seeing him unconscious as she leaned down. I'll check in every day until you wake up. Then, we're getting a hot pot, she whispered, before kissing the crown of his head and rising back up. She got to the door, giving Peter one last look. I'll visit you tomorrow. Promise. She closed the door and walked through UA's empty halls, her thoughts and the sounds of her footsteps the only things reverberating through her mind. For the first time in his life, Yagi was thankful for his skeletal form. The heroine, Mount Lady if he remembered correctly didn't even give him a second glance before walking to the exit. He waited a few seconds before sighing and pushing open the door, letting him hear young Midoriya let out a similar cry of relief from above. That was scary for a second there, Midoriya breathed. You don't have to tell me, thought my heart was going to jump out of my chest. No need to be dramatic all might, Chio reprimanded, you would have been fine. I'm actually glad you acted normal rather than hide under a bed or something. She probably thought you were Midoriya's parent or something. Yagi shook his head, recovery girl, we've been over this. Oh I know, Chio cuts in, turning back to her desk. The symbol of peace needs to keep everything a secret for the greater good. Yagi felt his shoulders slump, this conversation again. No, it could happen later. For now, he needed to discuss. Anyway, back to what we were talking about, young Midoriya. The young boy blinked, his eyes lighting up with realization. Oh, right, the percentages. Keep it down, will ya? Yagi said, finger over lips, the free hand pointing at Parker. Sorry, the young hero said, all but jumping out of bed. That's not. Anyway, what I was going to say was from what I've seen. It's around 50% if you're lucky. I guess, you're only good for about 5% for total control. Only 5 per. SHHH. Both Yagi and Chiyo silenced. The teacher's eyes darted to the resting Parker, and Midoriya immediately flushed with shame. Why you really think that I can only manage 5%? Well, Yagi said, feeling a bead of sweat run down his neck, it's a guess on my part. To tell you the truth, I really didn't have this kind of trouble when I got one for all. Yagi played at the distraught look that Midoriya was giving him. Not that you're not doing an amazing job. You're going plus ultra on everything and I couldn't be more proud. The despondent look lessened somewhat, but only because a questioning look slowly came forth to replace it. Then, what should I do? Chiyo stopped what she was doing and shot Yagi a scathing look. Jay just focus on recovering. 
Yagi stammered out, once you're back on your feet, I'll get you all the help you need, and all the time that you deserve. Young Midoriya's eyes practically swelled with tears. Geez this kid and his tear ducts. Don't start crying, it's a bad look for you. Midoriya sniffled, wiping away his tears and giving a resolute nod. As sorry, and stop apologizing, Yagi reprimanded, but he couldn't keep the smile off his face, just get better. Can't be a hero without resting up can you? Midoriya nodded once more, this time with determination shining in his young eyes instead of tears. God, Yaga's successor was a handful, but he was a good kid just trying to do his best. And so was he honestly. He was no Nana, but this was a decent start. An overabundance of concern and worry, and no small amount of pride when looking at him. Truly, this is how teaching should feel. Finally, a good idea coming out of that mouth of yours. Yagi actually felt like dying. Chiyo, did ya have to ruin the moment? The next day, thank you all for coming. I know that you have questions, and as the principal of UA I swear to answer each and every one of them. And with that one sentence, the floodgates opened. Dozens of reporters clambered to be called on, each one of them chomping at the bit for no doubt a piece of what had already been declared the story of the year, all here within UA's auditorium, at least within the bounds of his school. If he was being completely honest, this was the biggest public stain on Yue since he was appointed headmaster. A few events came close, but none ever got out like this. Despite giving him sanctuary, Yue was not all might. With too many witnesses, not even someone with his charisma would be able to negate a blow like this. And even if he could, the days on which he could were dwindling. Nezu kept his face completely neutral even as his eyes darted between the different reporters. He recognized most of them, top of their fields in one way or another. Any that he didn't recognize were in the back, the novice and young ready to watch the masters. Next to him, Vlad tensed. Aizawa would have joined him, but he was still in the hospital with Parker, and All Might was doing his interviews as per their plan. The rest of the teaching staff was focused on their jobs. Seemed like he understood the trial in front of them as well. Nezu allowed a small nod, and Vlad let out a long breath and pointed at a reporter in the middle at random. The reporter was a young man, stress making lines across his face. Even so, he zeroed in on the mousy principal. The entire room went quiet, save the click of cameras and the flipping of pages. Many of them got their recorders and phones out. Kirigaya Yashikazu, Hasu Tribune, Principal Nezu, UA prides itself on its alma mater, giving students the best institution to become the next generation of heroes. Yet, despite your school's impressive record, how did villains manage to infiltrate the campus, despite the numerous security features on record throughout UA? Nezu leaned into the mic and cleared his throat. The villains possessed several quirks that worked in conjunction with one another to circumvent the previous security. I have already signed off on renovations to the school grounds with additional security features to deter any further attempts. Kirigaya's eyes narrowed, be that as it may, as much as we would like to take you at your word. The villains already, as you said, circumvented your security already. Despite these new additions, how can you be so sure that they will be enough to protect the students within your school? Because now we know what we're dealing with, Nezu answered, the brawny man's face totally neutral despite the tense grip he had on his hands. Thanks to the efforts of our fellow heroes, we've ascertained the name and abilities of most of the so-called League of Villain members. Next question. The reporter's eyes narrowed further, but he sat back down, allowing a dozen other hands to pop up. Nezu pointed his paw at another reporter, a woman he recognized for covering on site attacks. Professor, you said that it was thanks to the efforts of your fellow heroes that you were allowed to capture and detain the League of Villains correct. Vlad's grip went tighter, and Nezu had to fight to keep his face neutral. Yes I did. The edges of the reporter's mouth curled up. You said that, but according to the police reports, most of the information comes from the testimonies from the students, not the heroes, correct. Vlad winced, he knew what was coming. He shot Nezu a pleading glance, no doubt hoping for an answer. Yes, well, despite the wealth of information, the fact of the matter remains that the reports were gained through actual confrontation with the villains. Students, who have yet to complete a single month within your halls were put against villains. Not only that, but there were two names on the list of students that bear repeating. Izuku Midoriya and Peter Parker. Nezu stopped the gasp from escaping his lips, but he could only sit there and hear the horror rush across some of the reporters here. He'd been waiting for this question, he honestly didn't expect it to be asked so soon. If he had to guess, they were paying close attention to the gossip mill among students in social media. Someone from the hero course must have split the beans by accident. Interrogation from the villains all caught and rounded up was another option. But it was far too soon. 
and he trusted Fukuda to keep a tight lid on such things. We're not denying that students were injured in the attack, Vlad cut in, taking the mic. As you pointed out, the students were had little time to prepare. Then why was All Might not present to save the students? The reporter glowered, trying to match Class 1B's teacher in masculine prowess. The white-haired teacher narrowed his eyes, but said nothing. Nazu closed his. He took the mic. Forgive me Toshinori, but it must be done. Simply because the students weren't the target, Nezu explained, as you no doubt have read. The League of Villains' main objective was to eliminate All Might. Everything in their objective is simply a means to that end. But All Might wasn't on sight until the end of the attack, the reporter pointed out. Because he was dealing with crime elsewhere in the city. While the class takes priority, the symbol of peace felt that it was right to defend every citizen that calls this city home while on his commute. Make no mistake, this was coordinated, it was ruthless, but it was unacceptable, Nezu said. He leaned in, his beady eyes darting to every single reporter, capturing their attention with a fire that they rarely got to see from him. Time to wrap this up in a bow. As such, going beyond the upgrades to UA, security and infrastructure, I have reached out to several local hero agencies for their assistance in apprehending these criminals. To seek villainy is inexcusable, to bring children into the line of fire even more so. The protection of these students remains our top priority, but make no mistake, All Might won't simply take this attack lightly. Even now he works tirelessly to apprehend these criminals while maintaining the security of our students even when they're not the grounds, as are the local hero agencies who are willing to assist the school in placing several heroes here on campus to act as additional security, boots on the ground. Let it be known, the League of Villains has demanded the attention of All Might, and they have received the attention of every hero within the Musutafu Ward. I'm announcing now that the UA Sports Festival will be a testament to this promise. They will not stop us from giving these students the best education into the hero field possible. We will not be deterred, nor will we falter. We will go beyond. He leaned in, cupping the mic. The reporters jumped out of their seats just like he knew they would. Humans, while impressive and capable of many great things, were predictable in some aspects. Give them an inch in one direction and they'll scurry along the mile to find out what it was. Plus Ultra, thank you for your time. Nezu allowed himself a small smile as he and Vlad stood up, ignoring the camera lights and demands for more questions. Don't answer all of them. Be clear and give them a resounding answer, both to the media and to the League of Villains. That day, the day was the faculty having a half day at school, with Nezu imploring all students to remain in their homes and not come back to class yet, using this time to heal and to catch up on any studying. All Might and Nezu then took the time to interview Bakugo Katsuki and Todoroki Shoto. All Might had wrapped up getting a general overview of some of the students who were by the entrance. Not much to glen on until they got to the blonde bomber and the Todoroki Saiyan. Young Bakugo's interview was quick and curt. He and young Kirishima were warped to the urban zone, defeated the thugs that tried to ambush them, then joined the plaza battle. Bakugo was able to handle the miasma fucker or Kirajiri as Midoriya relayed to him during their interview and from the facts given to them by police from the arrested thugs. He even said how he didn't wish to barter with the psycho hand guy, Shigaraki Tamura. Don't negotiate with villains. Give them an inch and they'd take a mile, he said. He didn't blame him. But again, he was. Kurt, blunt as a hammer when a scalpel was all that was needed. Bakugo was silent in regards to Parker, before saying how he screwed up before leaving the interview. He wasn't referring to himself, of course. Kurt, way way too curt despite all his talent. With young Todoroki it was short, again. The son of Endeavor provided a more in-depth insight into the villain's plans, given how he admitted he interrogated one using his eyes. Not the most heroic thing to do, but desperate times. He saw the plaza battle and came as fast as he could, working in conjunction with young Yeirazu and the group as they stalled the Naomu and Shigaraki. He felt guilty for not doing anything to save Parker, but he understood where Bakugo was coming from. Young Todoroki even admitted he would have gone about it a different way, but seeing how it played out, perhaps the best outcome was achieved, even if he didn't like it and couldn't save a classmate. And All Might had to power down for the day, and he couldn't go out heroing or make a public appearance given his time limit. What a shitty day. Toshinori and Nezu wrapped up the interviews nicely, throughout the day inspecting and overlooking every aspect of UA campus and their cybersecurity to learn how the villains attacked, and the symbol of peace slept on the couch in his office so he can remain within UA, rounds and prevent any further incident. Oh, hey Tashinori, a voice called. The skeletal man glanced up from the couch, seeing a tired Kayama Nimiri step into the room. Woman looked like she's went through the ringer, emotionally speaking at least. 
The bags under her eyes barely stuck out of her eyeshadow, but they were there. Kayama thought you'd be out of here by now, Yagi commented, burning the midnight oil. He then blinked. Um, no pun intended. The R-rated heroine shook her head, the motion almost making her stumble as she rubbed a headache. She must have understood what he meant, as she shrugged at his unintentional pun. It was night after all, only a day since the USJ attack. Truth be told I'm just getting started. Tashinori winced, like, he had a feeling of what was coming. Friend trouble, Kayama corrected, taking a seat on the couch as Yagi sat up to give her room. She's been beside herself worrying about one of your students. Which one? There were plenty to be worried about, but one stood out. Parker, Yagi's gut twisted, that makes a lot of sense. She's a hero herself, she knows the risks, but it's a little too close to home. She's been texting me every hour. She came yesterday right. I can imagine, Yagi said solemnly. And she did, but recovery girl sent her off after an hour or so. She hasn't come back but is checking in via phone means she has to be throwing herself in her work to distract herself. Yeah, but he's in good hands, as I keep telling her for the 20th time. Recovery girls people will work their magic and he'll be back up and running before anyone knows it. Kayama tried with a smile, but it faltered. If he does wake up that is. I've never seen a people sleep longer than a day when under recovery girl's quirk. Sleep deprivation. Yu Chan has been adamant that he doesn't stay up late on his phone or playing games. And the only time I've seen him passing out was the day of the incident. She rubbed her forehead. This is all just one big disaster. You can say that again. Yagi felt himself not along, completely unable to throw in the smile of his own. He kept heading down to the directory, only to stop once more on the addresses. Kayama, could you do me a favor and give my plans to Vlad? Sure, the heroine said, picking up the stack of papers, heading home to bed. Yeah, Yagi said, sifting through the directory, something like that. School's out tomorrow, and I'm going to make some personal stops. He picked up the directory and carried it, grabbing his jacket. You can rest on the couch if you want. Appreciate it, get some sleep Toshinori. You too, Kayama. The next day, Yagi double-checked the address to the home in front of him on his little notebook, ignoring the stares and gasps of surprise from passersby. It was definitely the place. Yagi steeled himself as best he could, and gently knocked on the front door. A few seconds later, young Kirishima walked out, dressed in workout attire and drenched in sweat. Boy's eyes nearly burst out of their sockets when he saw Yagi standing there. Whoa All Might Sensei. Greetings young Kirishima. All Might called, throwing on his trademarked smile and a wave, for I am here. It seems you're doing rather well. Working out. Indeed, the young man had a thin line of sweat running down his brow. Why yeah, Kirishima says, flashing a toothy grin, I've been hitting the old punching bag. Not much else to do with classes being suspended and all. Yes, All Might said, about that. Could I come in? Kirishima's grin faltered at Yaga's change of tone. Nevertheless, the boy nodded and stepped to the side letting the hero, dressed in his yellow pinstripe suit, pass through. The inner house wasn't much to talk about. Standard living room with a connecting kitchen center around a large TV, and a set of framed pictures of the young man and his family. Bit weird for you to show up unannounced, Sensei, Kirishima said. Would have showered and gotten dressed if so. I've already contacted your parents, they know I've come to talk to you. How oh, alright must have forgotten then, then you want some tea or anything, Sensei. Hiroshima offered, heading straight for the kitchen. I'm perfectly fine, thank you though. Please, have a seat. I don't wish to take up as much of your time. The red-headed brawler shrugged, pulling out a bottle of water from the fridge. So what brings you here? He asked almost rhetorically. Here it comes. The number one hero felt another pang of guilt wash over him. This wouldn't be the first time he did this talk. Many a hero came to him for advice and he would always do his best. But this, they were kids, dealing with trauma caused by his mistake. I was, Yagi paused, clearing his throat and ridding himself of some nerves, hoping I could talk to you about the League of Villains attack. The young hero to be froze, the water dripping off the side of his face. For a second, he looked like he couldn't believe what he was hearing. Yagi took a deep breath, this is where it was going to start being difficult. Don't worry Yagi, you can handle this. Just do your best, and don't beat around the bush. He waited maybe three more seconds before Kirishima noticed his current predicament. He whipped off his face and forced a lighthearted chuckle. He gave the most wide and fake smile All Might has seen. Oh, that beatdown we gave those villains. It was quite the harrowing experience. Yagi leaned forward, elbows on his knees and fingers interclasped. You must have been scared. Hiroshima rolled his eyes, flashing a confident grin, one that no doubt would fool most scared civilians. PFFT. Scared? Man-sensei do you know who you're talking about? Those mooks weren't enough to shake this man right here. 
I'm not disputing that, Yagi said quickly, smile still present but tone stern. I'm simply here to ask you how you've been handling it. The boy took another swig of his water, but slower this time. I've been handling it fine, Kirishima shouts. If anything it's just making me ready for the next chance to deck those bastards for messing up our school. I'm sure you are, Yagi nodded along, however, I doubt that's all of it. Kirishima shot him a confused look, only for his eyes to light up. Oh yeah, I'm pretty worried for Parker, Guy went through a lot. He paused, concern flashing through the smile, is he doing alright? Haven't heard from him. All Might relaxed in his chair. He's with Recovery Girl. I've no doubt that he'll be back on his feet before you know it. Kirishima let out a sigh of relief, his shoulders relaxing for the first time since they started talking. Oh that's good, but yeah, you don't have to worry about me teach, Kirishima said, posing with a flex of his bicep. This man is as solid as stone and ready to give those villains a good thrashing. His smile was wide, ear to ear, almost cringely, his hand holding his water. Yagi shook his head, he couldn't let this continue. I know that, but I'm sorry, I can't believe you. Kirishima blinked, what, you think I'm not telling the truth or something? No I'm sure you are, Yagi answered. Although his dark and blue eyes were hidden in shadow, his smile was on his face, but it gave a sad aura. The red-haired student looked surprised before gritting his teeth and leaning forward in defiance. Then what's the matter? What's the matter is that you haven't stopped shaking since I mentioned the attack and young Parker. The pro pointed at the bottle in Kirishima's hand, the water revealing the tremble in his hand that his smile tried to hide. The redhead noticed, and slowly, his smile fell off his face, his red eyes growing wider. All Might stayed still, resolute even with his smile on his visage. I'm not going to say anything that you don't want me to. Everything here is just between us. I am not here as the symbol of peace, but as your teacher and your friend. Hiroshima nodded, the action almost robotic as the brawler slumped down onto one of the kitchen seats. He stared at his water bottle, waiting for something to come to him. He let out a mirthful laugh, biting his lip. It's just... He paused, biting his lip. He closed his eyes and letting out a heartbroken sigh. I was right there man. Kirishima smiling ruefully now, eyes looking down. Bakugo and I got in there, we were so sure that we could take those guys out. All of us, like, there was no way we can lose. We're heroes, the good guys. He shook his head, sucking his lips in. Then when we got there, an ace was banged up. After watching his match against Todoroki, I thought that guy could jump away from anything. Can handle anything thrown his way but. There he was, in that Naomu thing's grip. He took a deep breath, and not moving. Yagi nodded. I read young Yeyarazu's testimony. According to her, young Parker volunteered to go along with a plan that put him against Namu to get Aizawa to safety. According to her, he was the only reason it didn't charge after young Asui, Midoriya, and Kaminari, with its level of power they would not have lasted. I've no doubt that they owe him their lives. Hiroshima cracked a grin, but one devoid of mirth, yeah, that's our ace for you, always the best. He gripped his fists, his hands shaking as he looked away, out towards the window and taking deep breaths through his nose. Yagi stared at the boy for a second, then it clicked. Not everything can be solved with your fists, young Kirishima. The odds were stacked against you, you can't blame yourself for what happened. Really? Kirishima asked, staring hard at the blonde superhero, cause that's what it feels like. I felt, I felt hopeless. Don't sell yourself short, Yagi said. From what I know, you caught young Parker and protected him from the thermite charge. You even had some minor burns. Chio got to them before they would leave permanent damage, only to drop him and let him get captured. Kirishima shouted, jumping to his feet, his eyes looking moist. I mean what kind of hero does that? Yeyurazu was riding on me to get Parker out of there, and all I did was let that handy guy grab him. He gripped his fists and he roared. I dropped the ball, literally, and Parker could have died because of my, of me. He bit his lip, breathing in hard in his nose as he fell back on the couch, hands to his face. Oh god, oh. He was doing his best to hold back the tears. He hasn't confided this with his parents. Yagi took a small sigh, although Kirishima didn't notice. And if you weren't there, what would they have done? Young Yeyorazu and the others. Kirishima looked away, running a hand through his hair. I I don't know, Yeyorazu and Todoroki would have come up with something. They're smarter than me after all. I'm just, muscle. They could have handled it better than I could have, screw up I was. Against a monster that had super regeneration, shock absorption, and strength rivaling my own. Yagi asked, your classmates quirks are impressive, but I doubt they would have lasted long without your help. Kirishima had no words. The boy slumped back deeper in his chair, and he let out light closed mouth sobs as he closed his eyes, tears being shed. Small whimpers came out before a whine and the tears began to flow. 
Toshinori got up and put a hand on the young hero's shoulder, firm but gentle. A hero isn't measured by how quickly they can take down the villain or how hard they can hit or if they have fallen. They are measured by the people they save, and if they get back up on their feet. There were heroes long before me who were willing to throw themselves into danger to protect their friends and others. Hiroshima shook, not meeting Yaga's gaze. It's all my. If I hadn't dropped him I. Look at me. All Might ordered. And the redhead looked up, chin going up and down rapid fire as he held back the tears of self-loathing. But he saw the symbol of peace's dark and blue eyes, and found comfort. If you want to blame anyone, blame me. I wasn't there when you needed me. I failed as your teacher, and you and your peers paid the price for it. But you, no matter what you say, you were there, you helped, you did your best, and you saved your friend. Do you understand? Hiroshima nodded his head and whipped the tears from his eyes. When he looked back up, Yagi could see that old confidence shining through. He smiled, one much smaller than the large and fake one before. But it was sincere, and All Might returned it with a gusto. But he knew that he wasn't finished. Thank you for stopping by. But it's unnecessary, the broad and built Mr. Asui spoke, sitting with his daughter and wife. Well, least he knew where she got her frog quirk from. Both of her parents were frogs. Suyu was silent as her father spoke. The trio sitting on the couch as the symbol of peace sat in a chair across from a coffee table. The frog-like girl squatted on her chair, looking at the textbook in front of her more than the teacher. Yagi honestly felt pretty out of place. He waited for a sigh, a little tick like young Kirishima to indicate anything eating at the girl. Instead, he found nothing. Even the parents were easier to read. You're taking this well, young Asui all might ask nervously. If you're wondering if I don't know how serious it was, don't worry, I'm aware. Her wide eyes looked back at him. Chances are that we would have died if things had gone even a little bit differently. If Parker hadn't saved me and Midoriya-chan, I'd probably be in the morgue right now. Mrs. Asui took a deep breath, biting her lip and looking to the side. Yagi blanched at the girl's bluntness and somehow found the strength to nod. Why yes, I'm sorry for that. He can feel Mrs. Asui narrow her eyes a bit at him, and All Might felt fine with the nonverbal blame. But he saw young Asui give her mother a nudge, not happy to see her mother blame her teacher. Don't worry about it, the frog girl said casually, it was the worst kind of situation. But thankfully we all got out of it. As much as it might seem weird to say, there's not really too much point in worrying what might have happened when it didn't. They showed up. We did our best. We got out and we'll train to make sure that it doesn't happen again, Ribbit. Yagi gulped. That's very mature of you. Thank you, Ribbit. Tsuyu admitted, and if you don't mind me saying sensei, I appreciate the visit. Yagi perked up, really. Yeah, it feels good knowing that Yue is willing to go this far to check up on us. Indeed. Me and Tsu chan talked a lot over the past day or so. Mr. Asui spoke. But our girl is strong and she's handled this better than I could have. You better make sure to thank this Parker-san. Mrs. Asui turned to her daughter. He is your hero you know, obviously, but he hasn't gotten out of bed yet. No word yet, Ribbit. Suyu responded to her parents. Gotta get well soon card and Z's candy for him too. Everybody likes chocolate after all. Well, except maybe dogs. And health freaks. Ashido-chan is getting everyone together to make a scrapbook. Yagi launched to his feet. Ha ha ha. Of course. You're the heroes of tomorrow after all. No one in UA is more important than you. He coughed into his hand seeing Mrs. Asui roll her eyes, even though Tsuyu smiled lightly at him showing off his charisma. But if you're fine, then I shall leave you to your studies. I am off to visit your other classmates. Take care young Asui and... He paused, bowing deep in respect to the parents. Thank you for accepting me into your household, Mr. and Mrs. Asui. Don't mention, you may be the symbol of peace. Mr. Asui spoke with a gravely voice, which made sense since he was a toad. But you're only human in the end. We all make mistakes, just don't do it again. Mrs. Asui added sternly as she stood up, storming off to the kitchen despite the look from her daughter. Suyu looked back, feeling offended. Don't mind mom, she was worried sick. Like, she broke out into hives when I got home after she heard the news. Yagi nodded. Well, that is one worry word of a mama bear. Or mama frog in this case. I can understand young Asui. If you need anything. He reached into his pocket, giving to her what he gave Kirishima, Todoroki, and Bakugo. Don't be afraid to call this line if there is anything weighing on your mind in regards to this incident. All Might gave a friendly wave. And now, I am off. He took off, leaving the Asui residence to his car, then he shrank down to his skeletal form, letting out a deep sigh and spotted the next address in his handy-dandy notebook. 
the wealthy uptown neighborhood of Nayabu Heights, Yeyarazu's estate. That's next. Ten down. Ten to go. She was quiet, eerily so. Yagi couldn't pretend that he had a perfect grasp on all of his students' personalities. But from what he remember, young Yeyarazu was no stranger to conversation. With how effortlessly she deconstructed the hero versus villains exercise, he wouldn't be surprised if her grades were the top of the class despite her peers possessing no shortage of tactical skills themselves. Yet her appearance made his blood chill. He had minimal interaction, but he had seen her to be one who cared for her appearance, looking as professional as can be despite her skimpy attire. She wasn't now, dressed in pajamas and a bathrobe as if she spent the last two days in bed her long obsidian hair long and scraggly in knots, small bags under her eyes. Even so, her eyes were downcast, barely looking at all might even as she served him a cup of tea, her hand minutely shaking. I hope you like green, she croaked lightly, taking a seat on the comfortable chair behind her. All might did his best to keep his smile up. He thought Kirishima was the worst. He was wrong. It has been a while, Yagi admitted, but I do remember enjoying a good cup every now and then. He kept up his smile, even though the cup barely fit in his massive hands. Yeyarazu took her own and sipped once, twice. The trembling of her hands was visible now, little ripples and jumps in the tea she held in her hand. She set the cup down on the table, fisting her hands over her lap. I'm sure you've no doubt figured out why I've come. Had to get to the point, as Yagi focused on the young girl. Momo nodded, not taking her eyes off the tea on the table between them. Most students only get their first taste of live combat in their internships, Yagi said. But you were unfortunately in the rare group who has to contend with it early. I suspect you need to speak of it. She didn't move. Yagi shifted in his seat. I understand if you feel like you don't want to talk. But, as your teacher I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you do. He gripped at his knees lightly. Yeyarazu's head snapped up. Oh no no I want to it's just that. She set her cup down and averted her eyes in something resembling shame. She coughed, and her voice became more clearer. I don't know what to say. Anything you want to say, All Might confirmed. Leaning forward, I'm here to listen and help. If you want, this conversation doesn't need to reach your parents. Are they doing well I hope? Surely they must have heard the news. Yeyurazu blinked as if the thought never occurred to her. Oh, yes, that would be best, wouldn't it? And yes they. They called me when I came home. They're at a conference in Dubai right now. All Might perked up. Dubai. Why that's where? A island is there right now is it? Touring the world. All Might spoke. He did recall that her parents had connections there. Father was an investor of sorts, while the mother had ties to security groups across the world. For the first time he saw Momo's eyes lit up. Yes, they were on holiday touring the Middle East. Since my dad has worked tied with I Island, they figured to schedule it when I Island came to Dubai for an expo. They're going to fly back tomorrow though. Yeyarazu shook her head as the light faded. I made them worry. Don't be ashamed. Your parents are only doing their jobs. All Might reassured. Now, he rested his elbows on his knees, interclasping his hands. Something's weighing on your mind, isn't it? Yeyarazu gripped her arm and nodded. I just, I can't stop thinking about it. That monst Naomu thing. What was it? Yagi shrugged. According to the reports, something made to hold several quirks and fight me. You were courageous to take it on to rescue Aizawa. Yes, I, I had to. After all, I am a hero in training. Momo muttered, looking at the table. All Might relaxed a little. Do you have any questions about, well, it? Yeyarazu bit her lip. I had I had no choice. I, whatever situation I thought of that. That didn't end with that, everyone would have. Do you regret killing the Naomu? All Might asked, and the black-haired girl gripped at her robe, shaking. There was no other way. It was made to kill you and, if I didn't do what I did. I don't even know if it was being brainwashed or made from a laboratory or it was a plain sociopath. The girl shook her head. I, I killed. I killed. Oh God. She looked up, eyes wet. All Might sin have you. You've killed before in the past. Yes. All Might was silent, as still as a statue. No, I have not. He said. But I recognize that is a luxury I have because of my abilities. I know of many fine, exemplary heroes who don't share it. He leaned forward, elbows resting on his knees as he drew closer to the distraught girl. Our profession is a dangerous one young Yeyarazu. The fact you are saying these things, contemplating them, is good. One can't be a hero if they care nothing in regards to taking a life, even a villainous and heinous one. All Might said assuringly, killing isn't something we heroes should do, should ever want to do. Unfortunately, sometimes there is a situation that is so impossible to overcome that in order to save lives, one must be lost in the process. He rubbed his forehead a little, reaching forward and taking a sip of tea. As I said, I've never had to. 
But, if I have no choice, if the choice is between an innocent, or a friend, or a fellow hero, then I won't regret my choice, even if it means I do not like it. We heroes don't really have a say when a crisis gets out of control. All we can do is handle it as best we can. All Might leaned forward, resting his elbows on his mighty knees as Yeyarazu looked back with wide eyes. Killing should only come as a last resort, Yeyarazu. His voice was stern, but not harsh. It was lecturing, but not condescending. As you said in your testimony to the police, you thought of the best possible situation to save yourself and your classmates. Had you not have concocted your plan, he looked at her with his dark and blue eyes. It would have been worse. That was your last resort. And because of it, Peter Sam. She burst out, before pausing, eyes watering as she put her hands to her face. Forgive me. I shouldn't shout. Yagi jumped at the sudden volume. Even Yeyarazu seemed stunned by the outburst. She bowed her head. All Might raised a hand up. This was feeling a little familiar, sadly but thankfully. Don't apologize, it's quite understandable. The girl froze at Yagi's words. She took several deep breaths, but it didn't stop the shiver from running through her. I've been thinking. About that moment in the plaza, she whispered, I keep running through the variables over and over in my head. Sui, Midoriya, and Kaminari were in danger. Mr. Aizawa was a hostage. We had to give a distraction for the three of them to escape the leader and occupy Naomu so we could get Aizawa-sensei. She grips her head, her fingers digging into her scalp. I, I try to think of S something but there's nothing. I didn't have all the information. I couldn't make anything that would help that wouldn't put Aizawa in danger. Maybe if Todoroki arrived sooner. Maybe if we kept the leader talking long enough for you to arrive things would have been different. But, it didn't. All I could think of was sending Parker to fight it, and what I had to do to get him out of it. She shook her head, letting out a sob. I tried to think of me creating new items, new strategies, but... They ended up in worse scenarios than the one we had in Peter-san. Yeyarazu looked away, biting her lower lip. She couldn't bring herself to finish her sentence, and Yagi felt a nostalgic pit in his stomach form. He was in those shoes, or slippers in Yeyarazu's case, decades ago. Following that day in that dark sea when he failed to save the closest thing he had to a mother. Her breath hitched, and she trembled at the mere memory. I don't know how we could have been better. They tried and tried to think of the best scenario with what we got and... Yeyurazu let out a bitter sigh. And because of it, Peter-san hasn't woken up. You can't blame yourself, Yagi said as soft as he could. His usual All Might form bombast absent. I've had countless what-ifs in my time, some of them even keep me up to this day. Young Yeyurazu didn't need to have those kind of thoughts now. In a perfect world, she'd never have them again. Give what had happened though. The actions you took were the best possible scenario, as you yourself stated back when you were questioned. Never killing a villain is one thing. But not doing so and resulting in a comrade perishing is an entirely different matter. You must accept your action, and that it was the one winning strategy. No matter what happens, as heroes we have to keep going, living with the consequences of our actions and how they affect those we serve, Yagi stood up. His voice higher in pitch so both of them could hear those words, and at the end of the day, if you ask Parker, I don't think he will ever blame you for your plan. He knew the risks, and while I know that's a small comfort, it's something that you shouldn't ignore. Yeyorazu stiffly whipped a tear out of her eye and shook her head. How can you be sure? Peter Sam. I don't know how he'll react. The question gave Yagi pause, then the answer came to him. Someone like him, willing to throw himself against impossible odds for saving his peers and classmates. Yagi stated, his suit might be broken, but Parker is a rare breed of young hero. When he wakes up, I'm sure he won't regret a thing. The young girl didn't nod, but she finally looked him in the eye. All Might smiled widely and flashed a thumbs up. Take heart young Yeyarazu, your journey as heroes is just beginning. This is but one part, a small bump in the road in front of your starting line. Learn from it, and no matter what you've lost, let it help you to face the challenges ahead. This time, she did move. A single resolute nod. I got a text from Ashido saying this. Warning, she was getting some of Peter's classmates together. We were going to visit him in the hospital tomorrow. I'm sure he will appreciate it, he promised. And young Yeyarazu smiled for the first time in what he gathered was several days. Thank you. You can be anything you want, Pete. But you gotta remember, when you have power, you alone bear the mantle. You're different. You got heart, kid. I wanted you to be better. You're an Avenger now. A day later, the first thing that Peter felt was relief. The plush of the covers over him, the bed below him. It was divine. Peter felt himself sink deeper and deeper into the mattress. Sweet Jesus he missed this. Unfortunately, it wasn't meant to last. Despite the feeling of bliss, the tiredness that had been sinking into him for what felt like the entire year was gone. So with an ease he hadn't felt in a long time, Peter opened his eyes to see a light staring down at him. And four machine pulsed next to him, 
and a small desk filled with a nice vase of flowers. But what really surprised him were the cards. They piled on the table, almost overflowing off the edges. The only thing stopping them was a book, its pages blocky and uneven with pieces of paper sticking out of it at odd intervals. Teeter reached out, his finger barely managing to get far enough to touch it. He felt that old sticking sensation and he pulled the book back. Get well, said the title, with glitter and stars stickered onto the top. It was a nice sight, but pulling the book back started spilling the letters onto the floor. From behind an opening door, there came a gasping sound. Midoriya is there. He's in casual clothing. But whatever problem he was dealing with is overshadowed by big grin and watery eyes. You're awake. Hey, this is a hospital. Quiet, came a nurse from outside door and the green-haired boy suddenly looked sheepish and his volume of voice dropped. Sorry, Midoriya fiddled with his fingers as he walked inside. Then he noticed the book in his hands and a smile emerged on his freckled face. I see you found your little gift. Peter looked down at the book, running a finger down the cover. Yeah, who made it? It was Ashido-san's idea. Mina, yeah when you didn't wake up on time she. Midoriya's enthusiasm petered out as the words out of his mouth caught up to him. On time, Peter repeated, how long have I been out? He looked around and out the window. This wasn't UA, but a hospital. He must have been transported. Izuku rubbed his arm, looking to the side. About three days, give or take. Three days. Peter didn't know what to think. He'd seen recovery girl fix Midoriya's arms and legs in seconds back at the entrance exam. Was he so beaten up that it took recovery girl that long to fix him up? Two pairs of bloodshot eyes, one having razor-sharp teeth, the other with patched dry skin with the devil's grin. He grabbed his wrist as the phantom shock jolted through him. Peter took a deep exhale through his nose. You don't have to worry about classes too, Izuku continued. They were cancelled after the USJ incident. In fact, we have a few days left. Oh, and recovery girl told me to tell that you should have healthy meals and at least 10 hours of sleep a night. Only, um, um paraphrasing of course. Peter nodded. Rest, that would be the best thing to do coming out of this. Yeah, right, rest, got it. The two became silent, and Izuku was looking back and forth as Peter looked down. He, he was here. He didn't feel any lingering pain in his chest but... I know that you've been having nightmares. Peter winced, looking up at Izuku with wide eyes. Um, um I was there when Recovery Girl talked to your guardian, Mount Lady San. They had a big talk about it too and she looked worried sick. You showed up. A pit started to form in Peter's stomach. God this is like the time that Aunt May freaked out after she found him with the spider suit on. The American bit his lip and sighed, looking away. The green-haired boy took a seat close by. Do you want to talk about it? Recovery girl said that your brain scans weren't good, least from what I know. It's difficult, Peter admitted, closing his eyes. How can one tell of seeing their comrades turn to dust, have the implication that their only family and few loved ones joined them, and leaving their one and only idol and hero alone on a dead alien planet? That's not even getting to the part of literally dying. And then I'm here to help you, whenever you want. Peter opened them, seeing Izuku look back at him resolutely. I, I don't know how I can help but, if there is anything I can do, anything at all. A tense silence followed. Peter stared down at the sheets below him. He knew what he was saying. He was grateful, happy to see Izuku open an ear to him. But, it's not that simple. What was he supposed to say? That he came from a completely different universe. That he fought aliens alongside heroes and wizards. That he got his quirk from a spider bite. That he's seen technology that was little more than magic to everyone here. That he died, where he does even begin. Who can even believe him? Peter looked down, then back up as his chocolate eyes met Izuku's emerald orbs. Those same eyes wanting, pleading to help him. He won't believe him. No one will. They'd take him for a fool. He would have to go with the cover story you and him went over months back. A veiled version of the truth. Aye, he's awake. Peter jerked back, and Midoriya almost fell out of his best as Mina all but exploded through the doorway. The pinkeet had a bundle of fresh flowers in her hands, but they were quickly forgotten, thrust into the hands of a surprised Tenya who barely managed to catch them while she came through. Ace is awake. Hey Ace, Aijiru called, barreling through the door and getting right up to Peter's bedside like Mina, almost knocking Tenya over as he went by. The flowers in his hands fell, and Tenya slowly looked up at the brawler. Uh, sorry there, Aijiru admitted squirrely. The studious boy adjusted his glasses, frowning at Kirishima. Kirishima, your enthusiasm is commendable, but this is a... Quiet, came a roving nurse, poking in at the kids as they blanched. This is a hospital, Tenya whispered very very loudly. Be courteous, he said, blushing deeply over yelling. Mina and Aijiru had the decency to look a little embarrassed about their behavior too. You're all here, Peter asked aloud, eyes wide. 
The door opened again, and in came Achako, Momo, and Asui. Sorry about that, Achako said with an indoor voice, was grabbing something to snack on with Asui. Speaking of, the frog girl waved her hand. Heya Parker, H. Hey Asui Sam. No need to be formal, just call me Tsu. Asu Tsu you said with her long lips forming a light grin. Peter looked over to Momo, who was dressed in a black blouse and form-fitting jeans. Momo flinched when she caught Peter's gaze. I might have gotten a little excited when I saw Parker, Mina admitted, rubbing the back of her head as she giggled. Why yeah, you know how it is, Ijiru added nervously. I'm surprised the door is still on its hinges. I swear no one knows how to properly enter an office anymore. Tenya whispered loudly, again. Everyone looked at him funny. You were shouting to you know. Everyone thought in unison. Peter barked out a laugh, he honestly couldn't believe it. They were okay. Beyond Midoriya getting hurt, nothing had happened. They were unharmed. He let out a longest sigh of relief, smiling. Thank God. When did you wake up, Parker? Ribbit, Sui said, going around the bed as everyone started to gather. Just a little bit ago, Peter answered. Nina's eyes light up at the sight of the book in front of him. Yes, she squeed in her indoor, you found your book. As sure did, thanks for making it. I was just about to read it too. No sweat. Mina cheered with a thumbs up. After what you've done for us, it was the least that we could do, Tenya said. The American held up the book, finally taking it in. The English words fight. Get well soon. Or on the front page, with red, gold, and blue highlights as he turned the page, finding the first of many get well cards he will need to read. But man, so much glitter. It's really. Peter paused, struggling to find the right word, sparkly. Mina and Achako shared a look and nervously coughed into their hands. Yeah well, you see, Ayama wanted to help out as well and he kinda. Achako trailed off and Peter knew exactly where she was going. Mina couldn't help but snicker. Guess I've been giving people a hard time. Peter's shoulders slumped a little. Not really, Asui said, with classes cancelled. It was getting rather boring all things considered. Just some online stuff and us being cooped up at home. I know right. Ijiru asked. I haven't done anything except punching the old bag and all. His red eyes trailed, looking at the pony-tailed heiress who was fidgeting with whatever she was holding. Hey Yeyarazu, you doing all right? Hiroshima asked. Yes, Tenya said, adjusting his glasses. You've been rather quiet this entire time. The girl stiffened under the attention. She looked down at the floor, and Peter could practically see the dread form in her eyes. They had small bags under them. Was she not getting enough sleep? Momo-san. She jerks back. For a second, it looks like she wanted to run. Then her shoulders slump, and the edge of her eyes start to water. Parker-san. I'm sore. Were you hurt at all during the attack? Momo paused, eyes widened as she looked at Peter. Yeah. Are you okay? Did those villains hurt you? I? And no. No they didn't I. I got a few burns but nothing major. Recovery girl healed them in no time. That's good. I'm just happy. Peter gave her a warm smile. That you're all okay. The plan worked, we all got out of there. That, that's good enough by me. Momo remained quiet, pink rising to her cheeks as she stood still. She smiled lightly, rubbing her eyes. Yes, T that's right. That's all that matters. The pony-tailed girl said with relief in her eyes. Well, the sports festival will still take place. Kenya stated. It will occur in a week's time, according to the press conference principal Nezu gave a couple of days ago. You sure you want to participate? Oh yeah, the thing in the syllabus, with it being on TV and being able to show off his abilities for heroes to scout. Why not? I mean, I am your deputy rep. I got a step up and his stomach growled, loud, and Peter let out a sigh. And I need to get something in me. I'm starving. I'll get something from the cafeteria, Mina declared. Oi, Ijiru kun mush. She tugged on the red-haired boy's arm, tugging him along. Okay okay easy. I'll come with you. Parker, what would you like to eat? Well, anything. Anything coming right. Quiet, came the nurse, roaring as Mina shrinked, letting out a squeak as the rest of the class slinked away. Up, the next hour or so went by fast. Peter and his friends ate food in his room, making sure to keep quiet outside of some laughter. A doctor came by for a quick checkup, and Peter was as good as new thanks to Recovery Girl. He had signed some papers, and thanks to UA. As head nurse's quirk, he was free to go. For Peter, he was only glad to see his friends socialize and banter. Thankfully there was no nurses snarking at them, and so far the topic switched to what was in the immediate future. The sports festival, a competition hosted by UA, that is broadcasted across the country. The first day would be all about the first year students, and the following days on the second and third years. The events change every year, and Peter understood. That would be within the week, and he would need time to prepare, given how many hero agencies would be in attendance. Looking at all of his friends' talk, with Achako and Izuku chatting with Tenya, 
and Mina and Aijiru gossiping with Suyu cutting in, to see that there wasn't a scratch on them. Relief flooded him. Peter. Came a voice and Peter perked up from his seat and saw you in her hero costume running over and her arms were outstretched for a hug, embracing him with his head on her shoulder. The blonde hugged him tight, and the boy couldn't help but return it. Whoa, uh, it's Mount Lady, Achako said with a squeal. You are right Deku. Wait, she's your guardian. Momo inquired with raised eyebrows. Peter let go and turned towards the pony-tailed girl and nodded. Thou, she. You're up and Adam buddy, you doing okay Peter? You asked in English, and Peter looked up, letting out a soft laugh. I'm alright you. He replied in his native tongue, smiling back as the blonde's red eyes. You sure? You hungry at all? Wanna go to a hot pot at all? Got an email saying that you're given the all clear from the medical staff. She then noticed the group of students in the room and the mass array of trays and food. Or, wanna put a, what do you Americans call it? A rain check, on that. She asked, what is she saying? I heard hot pot mentioned. Aijiru whispered in Japanese to Tsuyu. Beats me, English is the one subject I have trouble with. The frog girl replied back. Yeah, we can do that tomorrow or on the weekend. I'm gonna have a lot of work to do going forward. You aren't doing any work, you need relaxation and sleep. You said sternly. As she paused, looking at the onlooking kids. She sighed. We'll talk in the car. I don't want to make a scene in front of your friends. You got it. The brown-haired boy turned towards the group, beaming down as he collected the scrapbook full of cards. He has plenty of reading to do, and thank you notes to write. Guys, Peter spoke in Japanese. Thanks for checking in on me over the last day or so. I appreciate it. You'd do the same for us man. We're just happy you're up and walking. Aijiru waved his hand, grinning. Achako beamed while Tsuyu waved her wide hand. School is out in two more days, that's more than enough time for you to catch up on sleep I bet. Mina beamed with her arms behind her head. Teeter turned towards Izuku, the boy who saved him, and he held out his hand. Hey, Midoriya. Izuku perked up as he stood up, the shorter green-haired boy looking up at the taller brown-haired youth. Thank you, for saving me. Izuku blinked, and then blushed. W Wella, I mean, I was only. He paused, taking the time to regain his composure as he took a deep breath. Then he opened them, his green eyes staring back as he took Peter's hand and shook it. It's not a problem. I mean, we are all heroes in training. Like how Kirishima said, you'd do the same for all of us. Peter looked towards Momo after shaking his hand. And thank you all, you all had a hand in saving the class. His gaze focused from Tenya, Aijiru, Achako, Tsuyu, Kirishima, Mina, and finally Momo and Izuku. And me. He finished mentally. Peter let out a soft smile, nodding. We should all keep in touch more often. Sounds like a plan. I suggest we have a group chat. Mina raised her hand, eyes closed with a beaming toothy grin. I wouldn't mind that. Tsuyu added with a slight smile of her own, waving. Yeah, we can all be study buddies in this case. Help each other improve. Achako had her closed fist meet her open hand. A wise idea. A way to help us better ourselves as students as well as strengthen camaraderie. I approve. Tenya stated with a raised hand of his own, rising it higher than even the pink-skinned pinquette. I could use it. My written scores wasn't something to write home about. Aijiru laughed bashfully, rubbing the back of his head as he pulled out his phone. Oh, that's right I don't have my phone on me, but I'd be happy to exchange my number. Peter said as his friends got out their mobiles. Hey, if anyone has Jiru's or Todoroki's number, maybe they can join too. I don't have Jiru-san's number, but I'll be sure to ask her the next time I see. Same with Todoroki-san. Momo had her phone out. Aijiru stood up, grabbing his mobile. Here, tell it. Hang on let me get mine. Mina rummaged through her purse. So Peter gave his number to them all. I'll reply to your texts when I have it and it's charged up. He gave a big wide smile. So, I'll see you all on. Friday I think. It's Wednesday right now so. Yeah, one day of school and a half day, the next week the sports festival. So you covered for him. If you need to call on anything, if you need to talk, I'm a ring away ace. Aijiru pointed at his chest with a gusto. I would be happy to assist in class duties and what to offer as suggestions going forward. I am your class secretary after all. Tenya waved his arms again. Are you available for call anytime, outside of school hours, Parker-san? Momo asked lightly. If you want to, well, talk that is. Her obsidian pearl-like eyes stared back into his. Well, um, um I'm gonna be busy with stuff before the festival. He looked back, seeing you cross her arms. After I get enough sleep that is. He noticed you standing by, looking patient, but he shouldn't keep her waiting. Okay you all. Came a doctor who looked like a giraffe, poking his long head inside. Parker-san, you're free to go. I hope all of you follow suit as well. 
Got a nurse who was up in my case about loud kids. Mina bit her lip, while Aijiru looked away sheepishly. We will depart at once, thank you for taking care of our friend. Tenya stated with a bow, just doing our jobs. The doctor's head then left the room and everyone got up and began walking towards the front courtyard, leaving the facility. Okay everybody, I'll see you on Friday. Oh, and you're Araka. Peter turned towards the brunette, who perked up. Yeah, you called Izuku Deku several times, from what I heard back during battle trials. Why do you call him that? It does mean worthless, from what he can recall. Oh, sure thing. The bubbly brunette stepped forth, standing beside the green-haired boy who suddenly became as stiff as a statue thanks to being the topic of discussion. I thought it was super cute when I heard it. Achako added with a beaming grin. He even declared how it was the name of a hero too during the battle trial. Two birds with one stone I say. It totally is. Izuku yelled, grinning stupidly and making Mina and Tenya wince. Not so loud. You'll attract that nurse. Mina whispered. She could be anywhere. Okay, well, if you like, you can call me Peter. Or Parker, whichever makes you comfy. Peter came up, patting Izuku on the shoulder. I owe ya. For now though, let's focus on being the best heroes we can be. Izuku's flustered nature faded, and Momo stepped forward. Yes, let's. For all of us, she declared softly. The setting sun was pouring in from the windows, rays of light shining on them all. Alright, see you guys soon. And I'll hear from you too. Peter waved. I have a lot of people to catch up with when my phone is charged, like Pony and Hatsum. So I apologize in advance if I don't get back to ya. Just an emoji is okay. Nina gave an okay sign, beaming. Peter nodded and turned towards you. Sorry for keeping you waiting. You ready? He asked. The blonde didn't look the least bit annoyed, smiling. I'm happy you're okay. And I'm happy you've made some great friends Peter. Come on, let's go. Peter grabbed his belongings and walked off, hearing the chattering of his friends behind him as he and you walked down the lane leading to the parking structure, covered in shade from the trees lining both sides. He looked back, seeing his classmates talk in the courtyard, ready to their separate ways as they looked illuminated by the grace of the sun. They were unharmed. They won. They were safe. They won. They won. But he, he lost. Again. He couldn't do a thing. He felt powerless in that monster's grip, in that man's grasp. Peter looked down, the shade of the trees pouring and becoming darker as he and you walked through the empty hospital, getting farther away from the light-filled cafeteria. He felt like, like, a weak, meek, pathetic, insect. Peter looked up, teeth clenched and eyes becoming sharp. His hands balled tighter into fists. He remained silent, as he and you walked towards the dark and empty parking structure. One day prior, the day he got out of the hospital, Aizawa Shouta had work to do. The work of a hero is never truly over, as the old saying goes. Flad was busy with Class B, and UA didn't have much of a substitute for his class. Besides, he was able to walk and use an arm. That was good enough in his book to do his job. Even from his hospital room he could speak into a speech-to-text machine to get a head start with lesson plans. With the sports festival drawing near, he didn't have time to waste with needless pleasantries like simply waiting for the chance to go back to his office. Damaged as he was, Shouta was a pro, and he needed to hold himself to a standard. Even so, his stubbornness could only get him so far. He wouldn't have gotten as far as he did without cashing in on a few favors that Vlad owed him, and even then he wouldn't be able to do much more than give opening statements in homeroom for the next week, and that's if he was lucky. Snipe was kind enough to offer to take over the grunt work with the grading, and Midnight had offered more than once to take over if Shouta didn't feel up to it for a day. He declined. Out of everything, he needed to be in class tomorrow for the announcement of the festival. Midnight might be a wonderful teacher, but Shouta couldn't trust her to properly convey the gravitas of the situation to his class. Foolish, more than likely, but All Might wasn't the only stubborn man in UA. So Shouta was released, but he'd have to rest when not teaching. He was also given a prescription of painkillers to deal with the aches of his body healing over time. He was thankful for present Mike for picking him up and dropping him off at his flat. Not so thankful for the crappy singing and blaring radio. Made him wish for the silence of the hospital. He was going in and out of consciousness throughout his stay, as he hadn't had much time to ponder. The moment he got to his home he got a proper shower, dressed up as best as he could, and then it was back to UA, despite his long-time friend's concerns. After all, they had a meeting to attend. Special Cases Detective Tsukichi Naamasa, who was also representing the interests of the Musutafu PD, had been holding a briefing in UA with all faculty members present, including All Might in his thin form. 
as he did his best to edit the curriculum to Class 1A's syllabus with one hand in his office, Shouter remembered the details. The ones called Kirajiri and Shigaraki Tamura were easy, since the latter was the one of the reasons his elbow was a giant red patchy mess. It was the All Might counter villain, Naomu, and what had happened that made him feel on edge. His students, who had been separated by Kirajiri's mass warp, had joined the fray to save not only him but also Midoriya Izuku, Asui Tsuyu, and Kaminari Denki. Most of them got out unscathed. Yeyorazu Momo had flash burns, as did Kirishima Aijiru, but nothing recovery girl, and a good night's sleep couldn't fix. Midoriya used his quirk, again, and Peter Parker got the worst of it. Given the injuries he sustained saving Midoriya, and his group from the Obsidian Beast, Yet it was those three, in addition to Todoroki Shoto and Bakugo Katsuki that helped turn the tide. With Yeyurazu killing the Naomu and Midoriya breaking his body saving Parker from Shigaraki. Thirteen was up on her feet too, but she was given the day off to rest at home. This wasn't what Shouta had wanted, to throw his students into live-fire combat, in a simulation facility where the point was to rescue others. So the best he could do was levy the pros and cons. He reached for some eye drops, plucking them into his dry eyelids. The sleep and recovery did his eyes some good, but recovery girl could only do so much given the damage to his skull. Catastrophic damage to his eye sockets. Great, and here he thought his dry eye was bad. He'd have to test how long he could keep his quirk active once all this blew over. Face fractures aside, there were some pros to this. His students got experience that only a few third years could claim. Experience that would help them grow into becoming heroes. From what he has heard, they also fought incredibly well as a team. Yeyorazu proving herself to be an exceptional on-the-fly tactician and leader. Even Bakugo was able to be receptive, albeit from Todoroki's testimony his role was blast the warp bastard. Plus, they all got out alive to live another day. The cons, Midoriya kept up the habit of breaking his body in order to save one person, making him useless had his strike missed Shigaraki. Yeyorazu was forced to kill. Parker was injured and was in the hospital for more than a day despite Chiyo's quirk. The trauma many of the students had suffered potentially could be severe, had to be for the few that tried to save him from Shigaraki. Lastly, the media shitstorm that came down while he was away was something he groaned at. Yue will be under a microscope going forward. Thankfully Nezu's press conference did its job, and All Might was busy with interviewing the students one by one to reassure them. That should help, in some form. Shout aside. Yes, the first kill. Every hero who had been alive enough and involved in combat situations. Facing a villain who wouldn't yield. Where lives were on the line. Shouta made a mental note to talk to Yeyorazu on the side. From what Toshinori had texted him, he was going to her estate next after visiting Kirishima and Asui. Still, she would need some form of assurance from her teacher, as would Peter Parker, who had lost his gear to the Naomu. That fancy metallic costume had to be scrapped by All Might in order to treat him, and was with power loader. Still, Parker was alive, a miracle in and of itself, given how he threw himself against the Naomu, agreeing to Yeyorazu's plan. As if one self-destructive fool wasn't enough for this class, Shouta said to himself as he continued typing with his good arm, altering the dates on the syllabus. The three days off would throw things, and would cut into his students' training for the sports festival which would be in a week and a half once classes were back in session. But heroes adapt. They have to in order to do their duty to society. As he looked at the syllabus of exams and various training dates, he glanced at the summer section. If he sent a few emails, he could pitch for a summer camp of some kind, depending on how well his class was performing. Although he would need a better grasp of them once he sees them in action at the sports festival, feedback from their internships, and then final exams. He typed in to be determined. Something to table for now. With a few more edits, Shouta finished the updated syllabus. Now to tackle the schedule and calendar for the sports festival. He looked at the docket, mainly the order of events for the first-year students. Preliminary obstacle course race, random event, and then battle tournament. Under the random events were a selection of games and events the students would partake in. The ones who got the top places in the race. Calvary battle, labyrinth hunt, kingdom on the hill among so many others. There was a box for a suggested event that the teachers can offer but would have to explain the rules. Narrowing his eyes, Shouta began to think. Calvary Battle was a four-man team free-for-all for the headbands of enemy teams. Labyrinth Hunt was tag on steroids within a giant moving maze, courtesy of Cementos and Power Loader with a point system similar to the practical exam. Finally, Kingdom on the Hill was a four-man team of whoever was the four people on top of a position, 
and had to kick off whoever was coming on to said position. Small team games or individual free-for-alls. There, that can be an event for the first years to tackle. Shouta began to type, fingers tacking on the keyboard. Current day. Katsuki grunted as he pulled up on his pull bar in his bedroom, sweat dripping from his brow as he narrowed his eyes and gripped the bar hard. The last three days had made him stir crazy. Nothing has happened save for All Might coming by his place and talking to him about the USJ. That an online coursework, which was a breeze. His dad was a being a literal hen and how much he was asking if he was okay. Least mom got the idea. He was fine. Katsuki was fine physically and mentally. And yet, he felt cheated. He glowered as he dropped down, finishing his rep as he went over, sipping on some protein shake and wiping the sweat off his face with a towel. The blonde looked at his hands, remembering how they had that warp bastard pinned. Then the second he was distracted and saw his idol combined with Deku giving Hanjaw the haymaker, Warpfuck got out of dodge with him. It was so fast he, Katsuki scoffed, tossing the rag to the side as he departed from his bedroom, content with his private exercises as he walked down the stairs and through the living room where dad was vacuuming. He'd been doing that all morning. Aren't you done yet? Katsuki asked as he walked past the brown-haired man. His father perked up, blinking. Oh well, not really. It is spring and I have to do spring cleaning after all. Plus, the office gave me some time off in light of the USJ incident. Since I did say you were accepted and all into its hero course he said with a goofy smile. Katsuki narrowed his eyes and looked around. All Might was here a few days ago. He twitched. Did All Might notice that he and his family let the house go unkept for a bit? How did he not? Damn it all how could he have not noticed himself? Need help. Katsuki growled, going over to the cabinet and pulling out an apron. Dad looked surprised. You aren't going to practice your quirk in the garage. All Might was here, and things have been a tornado for us with you getting that promotion and mom not being especially good doing this. Katsuki grabbed some paper towels and spray. He took a deep breath, eyeing the window sills and he bared his teeth. Die dust bunnies, he yelled, spraying and wiping the window boards with a furor. How dare you jackasses show yourself when All Might was here. Go to hell. Be purged. Die. He roared mentally as he glared smoldering daggers at the window boards as if they owed him lunch money. So vigorous, just like your mother. Dad laughed kindly, and Katsuki's eye twitched as he continued to wipe the window sills, going around and scrubbing and cleaning with a fervor. This is the first sign of life I have seen from you lately too. Mom was getting a little worried and all, but she told me to give you some space. Broken clocks right twice a day then. Katsuki uttered, finishing the window sills before going to the floorboards against the wall. Is the upcoming sports festival making you any nervous? You can talk to me you know. Dad offered, and Katsuki turned, red eyes glaring. Of course not, you think I'm an idiot. He turned around. I've been looking forward to it ever since I got here. It's the fact that Parker ended up losing. Parker, his father uttered before he snapped his fingers. Oh right, Peter Parker, his name was through the news. He was hurt during the attack wasn't he? Got the crap beaten out of him and lost something too. His costume, that fancy powerful suit of his that allowed him to go toe to toe with Icy Hot. Even with that he didn't stand a chance against that monster. Katsuki looked down at his hands, the source of his powerful god bless quirk, explosion. He had that warp bastard on the ropes. He would have sent Hanjob flying even more so than that damn Deku did. But Katsuki knew, he couldn't have beaten that Naomu thing with his power. Not as he is now. I see. I am sorry to hear that. You know, you usually labeled your classmates with labels, like rich girl or four eyes. Dad mused, cupping his chin. For you to actually label one of them by name means he's quite important to you isn't he? He snapped his fingers and offered a big stupid grin. The blonde flinched, glowering before getting on his knees and spraying the white floorboards and using hard elbow grease. Parker is one of the strongest kids in class. That's all to it really. But he won't be that way for long. Ah, you plan on surpassing him then. You always say you want to surpass All Might as the world's most famous and richest hero. Katsuki felt a hand on his shoulder and he looked up, and Bakugo Masaru looked down with warm eyes. The fact you're taking this one step at a time is good son. You're shooting for the stars at first, but it is always wise to shoot for the hilltop, and then work your way up a mountain no. Baby steps ha, huh? Katsuki muttered, eyes looking off in thought before looking back at the floorboard. Whatever, let's focus on cleaning up all this. You're a lot better at cleaning than mom is. Now now your mother is a woman of many talents. Just like you. Dad kindly scolded him before going back to the vacuum, turning it back on. Katsuki looked back with a glare, softening his gaze a bit before focusing back on the floorboards, scowling with abandon. He couldn't beat Parker or Icy Hot with gear. He couldn't defeat that Naomu with gear. 
the sports festival will be held without gear. That is where he will surpass him and show that Parker where he stood on the totem pole. No villains getting in the way. No gear letting anyone cheat. No flukes, just the truth of what would happen. Katsuki grinned darkly at the prospect. But first things first, why won't this mark go? Fuck you, die, be careful. You might tear a ligament in your elbow, and language. Your mother, what did I hear you say Katsuki? Came a shrill voice from the garage, and Masaru's shoulder slumped. Katsuki growled out a sigh of frustration. Maybe home. Alright, the final interview. If Yagi Tashinori was being perfectly honest, he'd been dreading this since he got the news of young Parker's awakening. According to Midoriya, the boy awoke and had a healthy conversation with his peers. It warmed Tashinori's heart to hear that. The boy deserved some goodness after what he'd been through. Only for the details of said conversation to come to him from Recovery Girl. Parker lost his family, his mentor, to a villain. The same mentor that gave him the suit that he so proudly wore in his first exercise. The suit that now lay shattered into a million pieces in Power Loader's office. He didn't know much about technology. David would attest to that any day of the week. However, the feeling of losing a mentor to a villain, a villain that even with every drop of blood shed from you and your allies, still remains standing. A gruesome burden to bear, Toshinori could relate. But then again, he was older when his tragedy came. He had Gran Torino, a mentor level-headed and who knew the truth to confide in. Peter only had his guardian, a hero in her own right, but far too fresh to deal with something like this. She'd grow, but not quickly enough to help and that had to be its own hell. Regardless of what it was, Tashinori only got a voicemail when he called. Apparently his guardian was on patrol. Not the situation he wanted to have this conversation in, but Tashinori would make do. Dragging up the steps of the apartment complex in his skeletal form, he gave a quick glance down the hall, ensuring the coast is clear before enlarging. Smile etched into his face, Tashinori knocked against the faded door and it opens to reveal Parker with a rag over his shoulder and a spray bottle in his hand. Oh, ah, hey all might, Parker greets, pulling headphones free from his ears. Warning to you young Parker, I wanted to see how you've been faring, so that is why. All might declared with a friendly wave, and then posed. I am here. Parker blinked, then his eyes go wide with realization. Oh yeah, the interviews, come on in, Parker says. The young hero steps out of the doorway, allowing Tashinori to look out over a living room that was something. If Tashinori wanted to be nice, he would call it a perfect example of a cleaned up flat, save for what looks like boxes filled with scrap parts leading off into a bedroom to the side. There was papers with blueprints on the coffee table as well, being made from graph paper. Sorry about the mess, Parker says, pushing a box into his room I've just been keeping my hands busy. My room's a bit chaotic right now. I can imagine, with all that you've been through, Toshinori laments as he takes a seat. Parker nodded in agreement, yeah. He finished with a shrug. Would you like any tea? It's alright, I won't be here for long. I can tell you are busy, given what's going on in your bedroom at a glance. He paused, taking a seat by the couch as Parker took a seat close by. An uneasy silence fell upon them as the number one hero scratched his neck. So, how are you holding up? I'm doing fine. Parker looked at him confused. You all right all might. Me? Oh, er, yes. Everything's fine. Perfectly plus ultra here, Tashinori said, forcing out a chuckle as he offered a thumbs up. I came to ask to see if you were doing all right, considering what happened and all. I mean, I am, Parker confirmed with him looking to his room and then back again. Toshinori blinked. There was something wrong. Parker wasn't looking at him much as his other students had. He has to be in another place mentally, using this work as a way of distraction. Or maybe Toshinori didn't know what he was thinking when it came to teenagers again and was thinking too much into it. Geez it's like young Asui's interview all over again. But he has to get the crux of why he is here. Anyways, I'm sure you know why I am here. All Might leaned forward, gazing at Parker. I'm sure your friends told you. Yeah, Midoriya and Ashido texted me how you were coming around asking if we were okay. And sir, Parker took a deep breath, then smiled. I'm alright. Are you sure? You seem to be working quite hard. It's more of a hobby. Before I met my mentor, I tended to tinker around with things like this. Parker shook his head. Besides, I get to improve within the comfort of my own home. Still, the ordeal you went through back at the USJ, it must have been frightening, Toshinori stated. Parker bit the inside of his mouth. Well, yeah, obviously. Were you scared? Scared? Of course I was. But, who else could have stopped that? That thing. Parker bit his lower lip before taking a sigh. But, I'm just happy no one else got hurt. He then smiled. 
if anyone did on my watch. I don't know what I could have done with myself. Toshinori paused, and a silence fell between the two. Besides, Parker continued, I agreed to the plan Momo-san made. We knew what was at stake if we didn't intervene. No one died after all. He then gave a big grin. So, big win for the good guys. Even so, you're talking in a general sense. I am here asking about you. All Might reiterated. And I am fine. Sensei, you. You don't have to worry. I. Parker paused, as if he was about to reassure Toshinori. Then he looked to the side. I am coping, if that's what you're wondering. I'm talking with my friends every day so. I'm not gonna let this slow me down. He laughed. Gotta be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Spider-Man. All Might quirked his eyebrow. I see you came up with your hero name. Yeah, have had it, um, in my head, for a while. You know. He made some hand gestures. Spider is my quirk. I can do whatever a spider can. Makes perfect sense. Tashinori nodded along. The boy put up a good front. But Tashinori knew an act when he saw one. The boy was keeping his mind focused, distancing himself from the simple reality of the situation. There was a chance that he was telling the truth, that Tashinori was worrying over nothing. But he couldn't take that risk. Parker was his student, and he deserved better management than simple hope. Toshinori made a mental note to text Aizawa when he was finished, even as he kept his his face neutral watching Parker pick up his supplies. Still, I need to improve my skills. Parker looked at the blueprint. I made these with the mindset of what stuff I can get my hands on. But something is missing. I just don't know what. No reason to sound so discouraged. Judging by the look. Toshinori quickly declared, gesturing at the blueprints, you look like you're making plenty of progress on. Toshinori awkwardly scratched his face, W whatever it is you're doing. What is he doing? This looks like the complex stuff Power Loader does. Peter lit up. It's really cool. I'm trying to get the holo projector to hook to an internal feedback loop so the speakers can output any sound that comes out of the programming, and hoping I can connect it to a central mainframe. But I need to make to make a program that can receive this so I can access it on a computer so it can function properly. That way it can receive voice commands and I'm boring you aren't I? Oh. Oh not at all. Sounds exciting. All Might said out loud, offering a big thumbs up. Technology of this level is beyond my pay grade. But judging by your vocabulary describing your processes and goals, it sounds like you have everything under control. Parker lit up, bashfully looking over his work. I want to make it as good as I can. To match the work of your mentor, Peter barks out a laugh, what? And no, his tech is just, even power loader is stumped, and I don't think I'm ever going to get that good. Toshinori watched as the boy gasined a faraway look in his eyes. There was a lot to take in. Admiration, reverence, a hint of regret, but most of all, respect. Whoever they were, Toshinori had to admit, they must have done something great to have Parker remember them like this. Take heart young Parker, All Might declared with a hand on the American's shoulder, speaking in English. While it might seem like a fool's dream, it is the greatest honor for a mentor to see their protege surpass them. Parker looked back up at him, his full attention set. Well, I was more hoping to be a better hero than him more than be smarter than him, if you know what I mean. Doesn't mean I can't try though, that's the mindset of a hero right there. The symbol of peace declared with a muscular pose. You can do it. Parker looked respectful, but doubtful as well. Not that Toshinori could blame him. Even for him, after becoming the number one hero, recognized the world over, he felt little more than a pale imitation of Nana. A hero who could see something in an idealistic fool she barely knew and trusted him with the greatest gift that she could give. He may have impacted the world. She impacted him. Toshinori had only just started to get that part down. And remember, just because you think you can't surpass him, it doesn't matter. Parker blinked, his face scrunching trying to follow All Might's train of thought. Why doesn't it matter? Toshinori smiled down at him, his dark and blue eyes radiating the warmth of a sun into Peter's own brown orbs. Because he believed that you could before you even tried. I may not know this man, but I am sure he had that same mindset the moment he chose you. The young man stiffened under his touch. For a second, the boy didn't even breath. Then, the corner of his eyes began to water. No matter what comes, I promise as your teacher to do everything that I can to let you flourish. I will help you achieve your dreams. If you need any help, All Might put a fist to his broad bicep. Know that I am here. And by the time that you step out of the halls of Yue, you'll be a hero worthy of creating that same admiration in someone else. As he did for you, you will do for them. He grinned. It happened for me after all, and it will for you Spider-Man, the friendly neighborhood hero. Peter looked down at the blueprints, then back up at All Might, smile wide as his chocolate eyes beamed. Thanks. That night, All Might had left jovially, and Peter had the flat to himself as you got home from a long day of work. 
They made dinner as Peter cleaned up his mess in his room. Then he went about in touching up the rest of the apartment. After some showers and dishes, it was time to turn in. You better get your sleep, Peter. You stated as she embraced her ward. The American hugged back, his head on her shoulder as she parked back. I'll be up at six, but you better be in bed and asleep. Yeah, sure. Peter replied with a smile as the two went into their individual bedrooms. He's going to stick with his bed, no longer the couch. The lights were off and Kasa Takeyama went dark. While you dozed off peacefully, the American was still awake, a hand reaching out towards the ceiling. He imagined the cool second skin of the iron spider suit washing over him. Then he remembered how it became locked, and the black ceiling overhead. He can see scars and razor-sharp teeth. Peter turned over in bed, clutching his sheets as he took deep breaths. He closed his eyes, and he urged himself to sleep, counting down from 100. He woke up, earlier than he would like as Peter sat up, looking at his alarm clock. Two in the morning, despite him getting a good five hours sleep. He sat back down, taking deep breaths. 100, 99, 90i. He paused, exhaling sharply through his nose as he got up and tiptoed around. He put on his casual clothing, his eyes darting to the mass of blueprints and boxes of spare parts by his desk. He tiptoed through his room into the living room. He can hear the snoring from Yu's bedroom as he got his keys and phone, and silently exited his apartment. In his pockets were the folded blueprints. He's used to this. He did this a ton over the summer when he first acquired his powers back home. Aunt May was none the wiser. Peter exited the complex, hands in jacket and hood up as he walked amongst the streets under the night sky. Very few people up and about, with the streets being scarce save for the occasional truck or taxi. As he walked, his eyes were to the ground. He let it. He let it get broken. His last gift from Mr. Stark. Peter closed his eyes, feeling them water up as he made his way to UA. He pulled out his phone, checking his email to see the one sent from Power Loader. The head of the support department gave him an electronic key to let him access onto UA. S campus after hours along with entry into his development studio, as a form of a gift in his get well card he sent electronically. I gotta fix it. How can he be an amazing friendly neighborhood Spider-Man without that suit? The suit that let him become the ace. That let him do so many things people can't do. I gotta fix it. He stepped aside someone walking past, almost bumping into them. Looking down at the puddle, the person had dark hair and dark blemish-like markings on his face. Peter didn't tell, he was looking down at the ground. I gotta fix it. Peter uttered again as he pocketed his phone, making his way down the boulevard. In the distance, the UA Academy stood atop of a hill under the moon. The man paused, looking back at the English speaker. His blue-green eyes showed a bit of curiosity before he shrugged. No matter, probably some dumb kid looking to meet a dealer. He felt his phone vibrate. Gonna talk business with you soon. Meet me at this bar. Juran, the man typed back. Okay. And man known as Dabai got back on his walk, emerald eyes peering as he turned into a dark alleyway. His daily commute within the underbelly of superhuman society. It wasn't uncommon for May to wake up in the lab. Power Loader always had a conniption when he found her on the couch, work table or on the floor or amongst the scrap in the spare parts room, so she'd taken to hiding in the air conditioning vents sometimes. Besides, her babies needed her. They slept better that way. She slept better knowing they were so close. What was uncommon however was for her to wake up to the sound of someone else in the lab. Someone who wasn't supposed to be here, judging by the sound of how they were rifling through Hamura's toolbox. Never one for shyness or caution. The pinquette wiggled and shimmed herself along the air vent peering through the slits to find O. She pushed the vent open with a laugh. Oh, Parker. The webhead didn't even look up or flinch from his work, staring down at cracked, broken mask of his iron spider suit, laying on the workstation. May would be the first to admit, she wasn't the best with people, but even she could tell something was wrong when someone was standing in the lab at three in the morning, were staring at a broken piece of equipment and hadn't reacted to someone hanging from an air vent. That's the kind of thing that she did. Only she did it with a smile. Parker was not smiling. She dangled from the vent, squinting her peculiar eyes and zooming her vision to see him up close. She used her custom grappling hook and lowered herself down, hair dangling as she looked at the American upside down. Hello, she reached down, ready to snap her fingers over his head. Anybody ho. His hand struck straight up, too fast for her to see and caught her fingers before she could complete the motion. His grip, for a second hurt, but the moment he recognized her she could feel all the tension leave his grip, staring up at her with wide eyes. Hello, Hatsum, what are you doing here? He croaked. His voice sounded raspy, dry. She could see his face now, and there was a redness to his eyes that told even her socially inept self that he'd probably been crying. Or maybe not sleeping. I was sleeping. 
she answered, bringing her smile back to her face as she reached down to poke him on the nose. The question is, what are you doing here Parker? You a night owl, or an early bird? His hand reached up, brushing his nose and she could see when his brain seemed to reset looking away from her and back down towards the broken mask. I just, I gotta fix it, he muttered, narrowing his eyes. The bridge of May's nose crinkled. For her, this would be perfectly normal. Good even. For other people though, didn't you just get out of the hospital? Like, yesterday. Or was it the day before? No it was yesterday. I remember. I've gotta fix it. He repeated, not even looking up at her as he leaned over the workbench, grabbing micropiters and magnifying glasses, along with grabbing some pens and graph paper. I thought you didn't know how Peter rounded on her, eyes burning in fury. I have to fix it. He shouted this time, shrieking the last two words, and it made her jump where she hung upside down, nearly losing her footing on the vent and her grip on her hook. There was a silence between them. The anger left him as fast as it came. May's yellow eyes softened. H. Hey, Parker, you okay? Sorry for the yell but, I, I just gotta fix it. His voice was soft now. Why, I need this suit. Not this badly right. She hedged, and she saw his shoulders tense and bunch up. I mean, she tilted her head, her thick pink locks brushing against her face. The suit doesn't make the hero. He sucked down a sharp breath, and stiffened, looking up at her like he was seeing her for the first time. What? The suit doesn't make the hero, she repeated, blinking stupidly down at him as he blinked stupidly up at her. I mean, the support gear is nice to have but the support gear needs a hero. A hero doesn't need the support gear. You don't support the gear, the gear supports you. He stared up at her, and she could see in his eyes the moment something at the back of his gaze clicked with him. All of a sudden his body relaxed, and a tension she hadn't even known had been rushing through him seemed to bleed out as he smiled letting out a breathless laugh as his fingers brushed over the crown of the helmet. I, yeah, you're right Hatsum. He stepped away moving towards one of the chairs and seemingly collapsing on it, like the weight of the whole world suddenly crumbled off of his shoulders. His smile, it was so relieved May had to wonder just what she'd said. She looked puzzled, tilting her head again as the American looked up at the ceiling as if he had a eureka moment or remembered something vital. After almost a minute of him sitting and her hanging he looked up at her, realizing that the mad inventor was upside down. What are you doing in the vents? Sleeping. She repeated. What else do you do in vents? He blinked and stared at her like she was the weirdo in this conversation. You want some breakfast? He finally asked, standing up and walking over the two's faces. I know of a place close by that's open. Well, 24-7. Her smile came back twofold. Best idea you've had all day. He sniffed, then scrunched his face. Hey, after you take a shower first. Oh okay, you're treating though. Peter finished making tune-ups and leaving the blueprints in the studio as he took a cleaner Hatsum to the local diner, and the two got breakfast and filled their bellies. Hatsum had to get back to get a few more ZZZS before power loader checked in at 6, while Peter bid his farewell and returned back to the apartment, sneaking in around 5. He got into bed, took a refreshed nap and before long he heard you lumbering about for coffee like a zombie. After a shower and grooming, Peter was off to school, with his charge none the wiser of his little nightly outing. Walking through the halls of UA, felt strange. It was weird to think that, but experiencing it was something else. Hard to believe that in only two days Peter's view could be changed so much. Going from happiness to anxiety all the way to calming is a mood whiplash no matter how anyone sliced it. Then again, this wasn't just an ordinary week for him. Even for him, the kid that went from helping people cross the street to fighting Captain America halfway across the world, it was too much. But even so, walking up to the doors of Class 1A made his shoulders relax. He didn't notice it at first, but after walking through the doors, he saw the reason. Todoroki was staring down at a paper on his desk. Bakugo was brooding as always, and Midoriya was mumbling to himself, his hands blurs over his notebook. The way Ijiro, Mina, and Achako all chatted away around the redhead's desk, the only one missing was. Momo did nothing but smile warmly and wave. Peter waved back, but as he stood there, a certain brawler noticed him. Hey hey, there he is, Ijiro declared, Ace is back. One by one, the rest of the class turned to him. Smiles and welcome backs flooded from the classroom. The four-armed Shoji gave a silent wave, Denki threw a thumbs up his way. Todoroki gave him a slight nod from his desk, though he didn't look like he was trying to burn a hole in his head anymore. From what Peter remembered, his card was a simple get well soon. Welcome back man, Sato declared with a fist to his chest. Now we're all back together again. Mina pumped her fist up. March of victors, Takoyami muttered, eyes closed and arms crossed. Glad to see you back on your feet man. Looked pretty roughed up but hey, you are our class ace. Siro patted him on the back with a wide grin. 
Thanks guys. And thanks for the Get Well booklet too. It was fun to read. He looked over to Ayama who was sitting at his desk smiling, chin resting on his hands. A bit overkill on the glitter though. Hehe. <laughs> Nothing can ever be overkill when it comes to shining and twinkling. There can be no limit to such things. Ayama responded looking back. Trust me, this is coming from me. You kinda went overboard. Mina added. And the French-Japanese boy flinched and looked away. Peter laughed a bit but felt a tingle run down his back as he turned his head, and his eyes locked with the source. Bakugo Katsuki, the one person in the class who didn't send a card. Fug looked ready to light Peter on fire with his narrowed gaze alone. Guy looked angry, then again he always looked angry, but this was more so than usual, not as hot and wild, but cold and sharp. He wasn't baring teeth as he looked away. Huh? What did he want? Whatever it was, it was nothing compared to Ijiro who wrapped an arm around Peter's neck. Welcome back man. Oh, it's good to be back Ijiro, Peter said, and smile effortlessly spreading across his face. As wonderful as it is to see you again, we need to sit down, Tenya screamed, waving his hands, it's almost homeroom. Take your seats. You're not in your seat either dude, Ciro commented as he got to his seat. The bi-speckled boy paled and bolted for his seat, even as Peter disengaged from Ijiro and plopped down on his seat, behind Midoriya and in front of Momo. Welcome back, Parker-san. Came Momo's voice as he looked back, and he saw those relieved and warm obsidian pearls. Yeah, feels good to be back. He meant it too. He saw Momo smile warmly back, and he felt at peace just looking back at her. But even as he thought of homeroom, Peter couldn't help but wonder. Hey Midoriya, Peter called to the boy in front of him, who's teaching our class for today. Aye. The boy's voice trailed off as the realization hit him, I couldn't say. I don't know anything about substitutes. Oh yeah, Aizawa-sensei got pretty banged up didn't he? Siro said. Guess we'll just have to see, Momo added. Peter sank into his seat. Guess she was right, they couldn't exactly make a guess of what would happen. A sub seemed like the best option. Peter shrugged, or Mr. Aizawa could just walk in and say. Morning, Aizawa said, walking through the door covered head to toe in bandages, one arm in a cast and sling. The other had a cast but the fingers were visible. As one, a dozen heads snapped to Peter to see the American as pale as a ghost holding his hands in surrender. I swear I was kidding. I can't look into the future. Regardless of the reactions, I'm glad to see that you're doing well sensei. Tenya declared. I wouldn't call that doing well, Achako said, voicing everyone's reaction. He looks like a mummy, she added with a whisper to which Mina nodded. No matter what you think, my welfare isn't important. Don't worry about it. If I can walk and talk, then I can teach. Aizawa grumbled, taking his spot in front of the class. Then he looked up, and all traces of tiredness were wiped away, replaced with stone-cold seriousness. Because your fight is just beginning. Peter tilted his head, Midoriya shivered in front of him, and even Bakugo leaned forward. Our fight. Bakugo questioned. Don't tell me. Midoriya muttered. That's right, the UA Sports Festival is right around the corner. That's just a normal school thing. The class erupted. Peter felt the urge to bang his head against the desk. So serious, and it was just the festival. Geez he thought it was going to be villains for a second. Hey what's going on? Ijiro called out, should we really be doing this? I mean, sure it's listed in the syllabus but we just had a villain attack. Shouldn't we, I don't know, wait for it to blow over or something. Aizawa sighed. If I'm being completely honest, it is in rather poor taste, so we're in the same boat, he said, and Peter felt an awkward air descend across the class. However, after the press conference, Principal Nezu is insisting that it go forward. Despite the timing, or, more likely, because of the timing, it's the perfect opportunity to show how effective UAS crisis management protocols are and that everything is fine. At least, that's the mindset. Peter nodded, it made sense. The sports festival was huge, even when he first came to this world. He remembered you asking the day off specifically so the two of them could watch it. And the principal is pulling out all the stops for this, Aizawa continued, compared to the past years, there'll be five times the police presence, and to top it all off, Nezu pulled in some favors. Among the heroes attending the event, Gang Orca, Endeavor, Ed Shot, and Mirko will be in attendance both to scout and to provide security. And that's not counting the local hero agencies and other firms in neighboring wards wanting to help pitch in. And All Might himself of course, Mirko is here, the number one female hero, Mina excitedly declared. That's awesome. And the number two hero in all of Japan too. Man, we get to see Todoroki's dad in person. Denki added. Peter heard someone whistle, and he couldn't blame them. From what he remembered, those were three of the top ten heroes in the country. Though, he did get a tingly feeling at the mention of Todoroki Inji, the flame hero endeavor. He turned his head around, noticing Todoroki looking out the window, glaring. 
with the aftermath of the attack being at the forefront of the news, the number of heroes that will be watching this event will skyrocket, not just here in Japan, but a few other foreign firms will be attending as well. This is the greatest opportunity for you first years that you'll get, maybe the best any class has had. You were the class that fought the villains, you saw action before almost anyone else has. They'll be watching you, so this isn't something that can just be cancelled over a few villains. Peter raised his hand, and he felt Aizawa's gaze upon him. Parker, so this is one big job interview, Peter asked. It sure did sound like it. In a sense Parker-san, the festival is designed to test students in a variety of different ways. Momo explained, see how we adapt and what not. The perfect battleground to show your worth, Takoyami commented with crossed arms. Yeah, they'll be looking to hire us as sidekicks after we graduate, Denki said excitedly. And a lot of those sidekicks never make it big, kinda like you Kaminari. Kayoka added cheekily. The blonde clenched his chest. Really? Yay Yorazu got in one, so there's your answer. Comments aside, if you manage to get picked up by a big-named hero, you'll gain valuable experience. However, Aizawa stressed, your time is limited. This opportunity only comes along three times in your entire school tenor. If you don't give it your all, you'll be overlooked and never made it as a pro. So show the pros what you're made of, and make a future for yourselves. You got three shots, make it count. Am I clear? Yes, sensei. The class chorused. Even as his voice echoed with the others, the tips of Peter's fingers pulled against the edge of his desk. The perfect opportunity in front of the entire world. There was no better chance to make good on his promise. All right, that's all for homeroom, class dismissed. Lunchtime. Free from the horrors that came with Vlad Sensei's classes, Nito ranted about being better than 1A while Tetsu Tetsu kept screaming. Okay, maybe Pony was over-exaggerating a little, but she couldn't help it. She hadn't stopped shaking since the announcement. The sports festival was just around the corner, and everyone was abuzz. Normal casual conversations around the lunch hall had been replaced with harsh whispers and talks of training. There was a focus on everyone that she hadn't seen before. Well, almost everyone. You know, Peter said through bites of rice, I thought the obsession with rice was a bit weird when I first came here. But this is really good. Glad to see our tastes are rubbing off on you, Parker, Satsuna commented with a wry smile. Still won't drink tea, Peter shot back, not going to get me there. The greenette just shrugged, popping a dumpling into her mouth, I can wait. You'll turn. Peter rolled his eyes, and Pony noticed his gaze dart to her. You okay there, Pony? The horse girl heard herself yip, almost dropping her burger. She tried to compose herself while giving him a thumbs up, who me? Yeah, I'm alright. Nervous, Satsuna asked. You know, about the festival. Pony tried to keep a straight face, but she just couldn't. She let her shoulders slump. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous too, Pony, I'm sure everyone is. Peter spoke as he dabbed his mouth. I mean, everyone in our grade range that is. We're all in the same boat. Yeah, but all of Japan will be watching us. So many cameras pointed at us. Pony scratched at one of her horns. Guess I'm just a bit stage shy. You'll do great. Don't worry about it. Just do you. Peter smiled, waving it off. Speaking of, what's been going on in your classes? Just quirk refinement for the most part. I had to lift up multiple objects in order to enhance my strength. Satsuna waved with a hand nonchalantly, leaning back. So I didn't make as much progress as Pony here. Peter perked up. Oh yeah, the lizard girl grinned, knowing she had the American's attention. Pony got a real game face the last couple of hero lessons before and after classes were suspended. She busted her hump, let me tell ya. Last training session, she figured out how to fly with her horns. Peter nearly dropped his fork while looking at Pony in surprise, joy in his eyes. Hold on, you can fly. Ah, uh, Pony blushed, looking away. I mean, we had to get better in order to catch up. I mean, as Vlad Sensei said, class a last semester out did class B, so we had to pick up the slack. I just trained some more is all. Pony, you can fly. Peter beamed, grinning. That is awesome. Satsuna chuckled like the Cheshire Cat. How many pros have that sort of ability? And hey, you can get a better shot in America too since you're bilingual. That's always a selling point on resumes. The Texan girl couldn't help but cup her cheeks. Well, look, just take what we have been taught into the festival. Satsuna leaned forward, looking at her blue-eyed friend with her own slitted ones. You'll do great. You need to make a certain someone proud who she winked, to which Peter quirked his eyebrow as he fiddled with his chopsticks again. Who? Her parents. Pony fumed and elbowed Satsuna in the arm. Yeah, parents will be watching via livestream. Don't want to let mine paw down. Haha, <laughs> she laughed overly loud, nudging her green-haired peer with her knee. Sitsuna only giggled at her trolling. 
please 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 don't notice Peter. You know, we never did have that Tayaki date, Peter commented, tossing his tray on top of the allotted tray slot near the disposal. Date. Pony perked up, almost choking before she composed herself, and Peter glanced her way. After all, everyone needs a study break right. Behind Pony, she heard Satsuna choke on something. Peter looked at her with concern, but that only made the girl wave him off, stifling a laugh behind her hand. Uh, okay, Peter replied awkwardly. Later I guess, Peter said while waving goodbye. Pony could barely bring herself to wave back as her friend walked into mass of students. She didn't even flinch when Satsuna snaked her arm around her neck. So, Tayaki, she repeated, her grin clearly serpentine as she looked at her fellow classmate. Pony nodded. The motion was almost robotic at this point. Can I come? Pony gave her friend the flattest look she could muster. Do you have to? No, Satsuna admitted. Pony couldn't stop herself from sighing. But you want to? She guessed. At a girl pony, Satsuna declared as she slapped Pony on the back. You're learning. You would just barge in even if I said no anyway. And what? Deny the opportunity for friends bonding. Heavens no. Pony rolled her eyes at the lizard girl's laughter. Still, being together with Peter after what he has been through. Spending time with him again was the least she could do. She was thankful to Ashido of Classa for informing her of the booklet they were making. As she saw Peter walk off, her mind went to the sports festival. This would be her chance to show how far she'd come while in Class B to make her parents proud. To show how she was that much closer to achieving her dream as a hero. You need to go out there and tell the world that I am here. And whatever you do, don't forget that drive you felt when you were cleaning the beach. Midoriya Izuku felt his shoulders slump as he made his way back to homeroom. Geez, All Might really didn't do anything halfway, huh? Izuku could barely walk out of that office, much less find an answer to his idol's lesson. Sure, the difference between those who aimed for the top and those that didn't was slight at his level. But how can that little difference make the big waves in society like All Might said? Izuku could understand it giving people more drive but it seemed like there was a deeper meaning behind it somewhere. And the fact that he reminded Izuku of his trials at the beach. Was it the willingness to go plus ultra on everything? Even the little things. Of course, Izuku could also just be overthinking this. There might not even be an answer. It could just be a way to get him mentally prepared for all the training he had to do for the festival. Loath as he is to admit it, he wasn't nearly good enough to stand out in his current state. Kachin, Todoroki, and Parker were leagues ahead of him in terms of power and versatility with their quirks. Since he couldn't control his own quirk, he'd have to build his base which meant good meals and an increased training regiment if he hoped to gain anything substantial in the time before the festival. His thoughts were cut off as he bumped into someone. I am sorry. Hey man, it's fine. Izuku looked up and saw Parker standing in front of a vending machine, inserting some coins for a random treat. Izuku saw the machine whirl, but the chosen cookie didn't pop out. It was stuck. Happens to me all the time. Parker sighed as he slapped the side of the vending machine, causing the cookie to fall down. What's up Midori? Parker was looking over at him quizzically. Oh ah Parker-san, nothing much just thinking, Izuku said, nervously scratching his cheek. No surprise, heard you muttering up a storm for a second there. Why you heard that? Izuku asked nervously. Yeah, my senses have been dialed up to 11 from my quirk. Get a lot of input. Well that was. Embarrassing for Izuku. The young successor deflated, looking away from the American. Oh, I didn't know that. Parker shrugged before he reached down and got his snack from the machine. He tore open the wrapper and offered it to Izuku. Not wanting to be rude, Izuku took a chunk of the offered cookie and took a bite at the same time as the American. You're good man. Chill, Parker waved a hand as he grinned lightly. I know, Izuku said, even as he straightened up and put on his serious face, I'm just trying to focus. I've got a long way to go to control my quirk before I'm ready to call myself a hero. He looked down at his hand, seeing the scars on it. Do you need help with that? Izuku nearly tripped. W what? He asked, looking at Parker questioningly. Well, more of your control thing, Parker admitted. You went through a lot there, but that was the big one. Plus, with the sports festival around the corner you gotta get that quirk of yours under control. Why you heard all that? Izuku asked, feeling his embarrassment grow. Oh no, was he mumbling out loud to himself again? Ooh. Parker looked away, confirming Izuku's worst fears. He was. But, there was a silver lining. Parker was willing to help. The foreign student always seemed to have an idea ready, even in the worst situation. Maybe he had some insight that Izuku just didn't see. Yes, that's got to be it. But, you think you know a way to help me with my control? Izuku asked. The American hummed for a second, the focus in his eyes leaving as he no doubt pictured the perfect strategy to help Izuku take one step closer on his path to being a... Nope, I've got nothing. 
And just like that, all of Izuku's hopes died. Oh, B, but I'm sure we can come up with something, Parker said quickly. How about training partners? Izuku straightened slightly. Why yeah, sure, what should we start with? Parker didn't meet his gaze. I was kinda hoping you had an idea, the American admitted. I mean, it's your quirk, not mine. Izuku had no words except for one. Dot 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 oh. Parker chuckled nervously. Think of something later. He offered. Gives us both time to think on it. That's sure. Not the best plan but. It was a start. Parker's phone vibrated as he went into an empty classroom on the side and took it out. Hello? Oh, hey Momo-san. Izuku perked up. Yayorazu was on the phone. Oh gosh, he was talking to her so casually too. You want to get together to study a bit and plan for the festival. A brief pause ensued before Peter nodded. Don't worry about breaks, I'm actually going out to do that with a few friends of mine. Parker looked off as he paced around, Izuku watching his call. Oh, how he wished he could talk to a girl over the phone so easily. They're from class B you wanna come with. Okay cool, meet me by that Tayaki place outside of school. Parker nodded. It's called Somi Somi. Yeah. Okay, see ya then Momo-san. He hung up and looked at Izuku before looking confused. Um, Midori. Is there? He pointed at his face. Something on my face. Eck. He was staring too long. And nothing. Sorry, I should get going. See can I message you about when we should get together soon. Izuku spoke in a higher octave, pink rushing to his cheeks. Yeah, no worries. See ya then, Midoriya. He smiled, patting Izuku on the back as he walked off. Izuku blinked. The boy could only blush and shake his head. He had study hall to do. Got to catch up on meth. After school, Pony didn't think that this could get any worse. However, she'd forgotten how nice Peter was. I'd like a Nutella, custard, and red bean teyaki please. Peter ordered at the front counter in front of Somi Somi, the local teyaki joint near UA. S campus, what do you girls want? Yeyorazu Momo stood calmly with a pleased look on her face, while Pony looked perturbed. Satsuna on the other hand. Huh, guess Parker-san really is a player. She smirked under her breath, taking in the sight of her standing by her fellow peer in class B. Her fellow recommended peer in the black-haired heiress had to come with it seemed, with Peter having introduced Momo to her when they arrived. Peter looked confused. Hey, Peter said getting everyone's attention again. Like I said, you girls want anything. I'll have what you're having, Parker-san. Momo offered her debit card. And I'll pay. Don't worry. Pawnee's ears seemed to droop further. Sitsuna took it upon herself to pat her friend on the back. Don't worry, we're amongst friends. Yeah, Momo isn't a bad dude. She's nothing like that Bakugo guy Tetsu Tetsu mentioned in the group text. The American girl sighed. Yes, their overly loud classmate was on Cap's lock cruise control when he came in on the mob right next door in front of Class 1A's room. He did say that the blonde boy was a jerk, but he doesn't represent all of Class A, as much as Nito tries his damns to portray him as. Sadly, he may be right, considering how some general ed students seem to talk about and gossip about it on the few social media sites Pony tends to lurk on. I wanted it to be just us. Pony muttered as Momo and Peter got their fish-shaped waffle pastries and were talking about chemical formulas. Yeah, that was beyond her pay grade. You'll get him next time. Satsuna winked. You just gotta be more forward. You know, like how most Americans like you and Parker are. It's not like that. Pony whispered harshly. It's easier said than do. Pony. Talkage. Peter asked. Something up. Huh? Oh, nothing. Come on, let's make our order. Satsuna dragged her blonde friend along, who seemed to only move at the serpentine girl's behest. Pony made a note to approach Peter in the future and ask for an outing. Alone. That night, the underground flat was dim and dark as Dabai approached its front door. Well, more like back door, given how the only entrance inside was through the back alleys of the dark residential district of Camino Ward. He looked at his watch. Two in the morning. He knocked three times, paused, then knocked two times in quick succession. The door opened, and the dark-haired man saw his business partner. Evening Dabai, Juran said with a tip of his cap. Juran, come on in. It's humid out there and I don't want to burn AC. The underworld middleman stated as Dabai walked inside the dimly lit apartment. So, get the job done. Dabai reached into his coat and pulled out a plastic bag, setting it down on the kitchen table. To the side he heard a loud slurping noise. Juran took the baggie, bringing it up to his eyes to inspect its contents. He let out a whistle. Geez, guy's finger looks like an overcooked sausage or a burnt marshmallow. He give you any trouble. He didn't pay up, so he paid another way. Dabai stated as a matter of fact. As you said in the email, he heard the sound of slurping. 
he turned, seeing the source of the noise coming from behind a couch. Don't mind her, she's one of my newest partners. Juran waved a hand as Dabai stood up, walking over, and he caught the smell of blood as he saw a blonde-haired girl in a school uniform suck out blood from someone's neck through a metal straw or needle. The man's face was unrecognizable thanks to the countless stab wounds that would have made Dabai in his earlier days vomit, his attire that of a typical Salariman. The girl's hair was in two buns, wild and unkempt. Her eyes were on the verge of rolling into her skull, blood leaking from her lips as she let out slurping sucking sounds, her legs shivering in. The light. She even moaned, giggling and shuddering as she rocked back and forth as she moved aside the straw, now biting into the corpse's neck. Dabai noticed sharp vampiric-like canines as the girl went to town. The fact he still looked warm meant he had just been killed within the last few minutes. And judging by his bulging eyes and the knife wounds all over his face and chest, this girl had gone wild. Dabai had seen many things in his time in the underworld. She must be a real freak. Partner, Dabai said aloud, looking back to his associate. She's very enthusiastic. Poor Sap owed a lot of people money. When he didn't pay up, well, he brought a finger to his neck, letting out a GRRRRHK sound. I'll take whatever he has left to pawn off for collateral, but that's one less creditor to worry about. Pretty risky to bring a kill to your place, especially one so fresh. I know of some proper cleaners, don't worry. Juran patted him on the back as he guided the taller cremation user away away from the blood-sucking blonde. Anyways, here it is, he reached into his pocket and handed Dabai a fat wad of bills. Your payment. Pleasure doing business with you. He took them, pocketing them. Juran was a bit slimy but he wasn't as bad as those psychotic Yakuza thugs. And he had connections in high places, and high places meant connections to those with cold hard cash. Likewise, so, Jiren clicked his tongue. I got word that I may be getting a big score soon, and I want you to be in on it. Dabai looked at him. Like what? Well, nothing's really set in stone, but stay on the down low for now. In three weeks or so, I'll have more information. It's gonna be quite profitable too. Juran grinned, showing off his grills as his eyes seemed to be shine with yen and dollar signs. Dabai didn't care less. He just needed money, and if he could get rid of some scummy dishonest people doing it, well, all the better. You know how to find me then. He looked over, seeing the corpse's feet behind the couch slink further as he heard more bestial gasps and sighs from the schoolgirl. She sounded like she was playing with herself, but the slurping suggested otherwise. Yep, definitely a freak. I won't keep you waiting. I got another job, but it's for the missus here. Juran patted him on the back as he escorted him to the entrance. We'll keep in touch. Dabai got to the door, his blue-green eyes looking back at his shorter shady confidant. We shall. And he closed the door. Sooner he got away from that bloodsucker, the better. The next day, it was early morning on Dagoba Beach, with Parker gazing down at his watch. The stars were still out, but the dawn was approaching soon. Better to work out early than later, he suggested over a text message. He suppressed a yawn, rubbing his eyes as he stood on the sand. Izuku waved as he jogged towards the American. Mom knew of his early morning workout routine, and she was fine with it for the most part. Hey Parker Sam. Parker perked up, turning towards the sight of the shorter green-haired boy running towards him. Like him, he was also in workout fatigues. Those same light green ones from before, back in the practical exam. Yo, Parker waved, and Izuku arrived with a light sheen of sweat on his brow, ready to go for a run. Heard running on sand helps better build stamina. He was barefoot which Izuku took note of. Sure, he said, getting down to remove his shoes and socks. I've never really worked out with someone of my own age group. Most I have had is just, well, a trainer. A trainer, huh? Well, no worries. Now we can talk while we run. Parker had his hands on his hips. Sleep well, I hope. Yeah, I've gotten better at training over the last year while I prepared to go to UA. Deku replied as he got up and shifted into a jog. The American followed suit. I see. Another thing from your trainer. He asked, the two now trotting through the sand, Musutafu to their right and the sea to their left. You could say that. Deku beamed with a wide grin. Parker couldn't help but smile back as they ran down the beach. Nice job recommending this place to man. Parker panted a little. Thought this place was supposed to be messy, it's so clean. Izuku blushed under the praise. You don't have to tell me twice, I had a hand in cleaning it. Wait, now he sounded cocky. I mean, not to boast or anything. It was, just, a part of my training routine is all. It's fine, Parker looked back. You did good cleaning this up. I'm surprised. At the city, he took deep breaths. Dot 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 HS and cleaned this up sooner. They ran past an empty lifeguard tower. Well, trash has to go somewhere, sadly. Deku replied, wiping his brow. 
Before long, the two made it to another tower, then another, and over a dozen towers passed before they stopped to take a breather before starting their next set. Okay, Parker took a seat by the tower. Let's talk ideas. He saw Izuku reach for his water bottle, taking a swig before capping it. About my quirk, Deku asked, to which the American nodded. Yeah, let's start with what your quirk is. Izuku seemed to pale, biting his lower lip at Parker's inquiry. He couldn't tell Parker his secret. He had already somewhat told Kachin already, and All Might was fine with it, but Parker might catch on quicker than his childhood friend could. He was thankful that Kachin hadn't figured it out despite his intelligence. Well, um, how do I say this? Izuku fiddled with his fingers a bit. Well, it's a bit complicated. How so? The American quirked an eyebrow. Izuku panicked. Don't give it away. Well, who? Izuku looked to the side, trying to find the words. I haven't had a chance to use my, um, quirk all my life due to its recoil effect, as you saw back at the entrance exam against the giant robot. Oh yeah, Parker blanched. I remember. It's sort of a double-edged sword for me right now. Like, I can only use two modes of my power. Izuku looked down at his fist, flexing it slowly, either at 0% or at max power 100%. He frowned lightly, but, I had something happen to me lately, or rather, something I noticed about my quirk. He looked back at Peter, Parker saying, um, don't mind if I talk about the, Izuku stopped, his voice trailing off. Parker blinked and crossed his arms. About the what? He asked, and Izuku looked to the side since he was unable to look him in the eye. The USJ, Izuku said quickly. His deputy representative stared back and sighed. Feel free man, don't let what happened to me get you down. Peter rubbed the back of his head as he got up and stretched his arms. I knew going in that I had to save Aizawa from that beast. I told Yeyorazu whatever it takes, and I meant it. Besides, he knelt down, stretching his legs. You did save me from Shigaraki. Peter looked back up with sincere eyes. That counts for something, and thanks for that, by the way. Sorry if it's a repeat, but I wanted to tell you that in person. The sky was beginning to turn orange as Izuku stood frozen, and then he blushed. Oh, well, it's nothing. I mean, you would have done the same for me if you were in my shoes. He waved his arms, looking to the side. I couldn't just stand there. He paused, looking back at Parker. Peter smiled back softly, and the two boys were silent. So don't let what happened to me result in you walking on eggshells. What about the USJ? Well, when I first struck the Naomu, I had originally intended on trying to save Asui, I mean Tsuyu-san from Shigaraki. Izuku recollected, remembering his appearance by the shore, leaping up to strike the teal-haired psychopath to just get him away from her. And I punched with all I had and yet, my body didn't suffer any recoil at all. He looked down at his hands. My body didn't break. Granted I got the Naomu instead because it rushed to his defense, but I was still able to move afterward. And that's when me, Momo-san, and Jiru-san came in. Peter mused, so that tornado came from you. Not surprising, what you were able to do against the Zero Pointer and in the battle trial. The American mused as he got up, now performing standing toe touches. So, you said that you could only use your power at max or none at all. Did you use max power when you got? He rose back up and then squatted before going back up and then doing another toe touch. Out of the water to defend Tsuyu. Max power, Izuku mused, the words resounding in his mind as he looked back in those precious few moments. When he tried to save her from Shigaraki's hands, all he wanted was to get him away from her. His body moved on its own, but he never used Max power, not until he had to use his legs to fling himself towards Shigaraki when the man had Peter hostage, and again when he used his arm, because he was about to use an ability that could level building-sized robots and bust through ceilings like paper. I held back then. Izuku said aloud, I didn't want to kill them, just to get them away. You're not the only one with super strength, Peter suggested as he took a seat. So you held back subconsciously, I can get that. But, from the moment you leapt from the water to the ground, he pointed, did you use your power then? I mean, it was so fast I, Izuku looked away. I don't remember much but, maybe I did. He then remembered his conversation with All Might back in the hospital room. How he guessed that Izuku could only use 5% of his power. Well, you had to. I mean, getting from the water to ground level without climbing has to be exhausting. Peter commented. The other times that I saw you use your quirk you focused the power into your arms, legs, or your finger that one time during the quirk test. Izuku deflated where he stood. Don't remind me. I still hear Mr. Aizawa lecturing me about my control when I go to sleep. 
That's not healthy, Parker commented, which only made Izuku slump further. Hey, but it's a place to start. The American quickly recovered. How are you controlling it now? Oh, Izuku said perking up. It's sort of like a feeling of whoosh. In Kapow, like an egg exploding in a microwave. The American stared at him blankly, and Izuku felt like jumping into a hole right then and there. All Might at least understood the reference and the cheesiness. Parker was gonna think that he's a super dork now. Izuku wrapped his arms around his head, trying to look away. I, I know it's really lame. It's like the radiation is overtaking you and you're on the verge of bursting. Parker explained, clapping his hands. That's perfect. Huh? That's a more scientific, comic book-like analogy. Better than an egg in a microwave. Why yeah, Izuku said nervously, I thought so too. Parker turned away, his eyes taking on a faraway look. Hum, if that's what we're working with, maybe you should start thinking like a pressure cooker on overdrive. Gee, good idea, but the pressure sounds like it could blow my arm off, Izuku said. Parker grimaced, yeah I don't want that. I don't know maybe you should set it to something like, boil. The image of Izuku's arm lighting on fire filled his mind. He shook his head at the sight. Yeah no. Oven, the American offered. Izuku's arm being roasted alive in a rotisserie didn't paint a pleasant picture. Not much better. The brown-haired boy seethed and shrugged. Then I got nothing, Parker said, slumping with exasperation. It's okay, I wasn't expecting anything big. Yeah, I'm not much of a master chef, Parker admitted. I just cook things through and hope for the best. Cook things through. Izuku's eyes widened as he looked down. That's it, huh? Peter mused aloud. Izuku looked down at his hands, grinning as he gripped his fists. I had it all wrong. I was only using one for all in my arms and legs at max power. But when I used it in another way, through my whole body, I managed to get the proper image of the egg not exploding in the microwave. Izuku thought, smiling as he conjured his ability. He felt the heat of his inherited quirk surge through his body. He gritted his teeth, the red lines surging through his body. 5%. Don't concentrate it all into one or two places. Let it spread. And the rainbow light surged from one to another. Parker stood up, eyes wide as Izuku's body glowed. Throughout, cook it through. Izuku focused, and the red lines faded. And green lightning surged from his body as the American blinked. Did something big just happen? Parker asked, pointing at Izuku. Izuku grinned as he looked back. Parker Sam, thank you. You helped me realize something very important about my ability just now. Izuku felt the heat cover his entire body, but it wasn't as intense as those times from before. It was like a warm feeling surging through all of his pores now. This, this was one for all. He was one step closer to being just like All Might. Well, Peter looked to the side before clasping his hands. Then he saw the joy and revelation within the green-haired boy's eyes and he couldn't help but grin with him. I'm glad that I could help, man. He laughed, going up to him. Is this light you're emitting? The lightning around you, your power under control. Izuku released a breath, and the light faded as he sighed. So, that was how it felt to let one for all surge through his body at 5%. It was incredible. He raised his head, and he smiled back at Peter. Yeah, my power was a bit rough to figure out, but I had to imagine an egg in the microwave in order for me to control it. But your analogy helped me get to that picture faster. He looked at his hands. He had to tell All Might about this in class. Heck, he had to text him a SAP. Maybe he could come to the beach today, or Izuku could show him at UA. Glad I could help, Peter offered his hand. Yeah, Izuku walked up, and as the rising sun rose over the town, the two boys shook hands. Parker Sam, let's do our best at the sports festival. He grinned, and Peter couldn't help but smile back as the sun's light overtook them. You got it. Later that day, it had taken him six years, but Toshinori had finally found something more painful than his injury. Paperwork. God, was it always this bad? Even hero work didn't have this mountain of paper perpetually poised to ambush him. Granted it was a mountain that he'd made, but he was above complaining about that as well. With the lessons being so minimal, Toshinori took it upon himself to diversify the plans going forward. Nezu wanted him resting and planning with the police, but with his three hours already spent for the day, his skeletal form came with an abundance of free time, which left him with few options to pass the time. Normally he'd grab a bite to eat before heading home to watch the news, and he tried that, until he learned that it was all nothing but preparations for the sports festival. Who would be serving food, who was on groundskeeping duty during off hours, who would be there as security, the whole nine yards. Try as he might, Toshinori really couldn't bring himself to listen to things that he already knew. The only thing that he took from the news was that Nezu was really pulling out all the stops. Information on villain activity was practically non-existent on the main channels. Now Toshinori would never say that it was a bad thing, 
but it still surprised him that the principal was able to get this much done, if it was him at all. So he turned to the schoolwork that he'd just been accepting. Nezu was kind enough to give him the basics, but after the interviews, Toshinori couldn't just sit back and let this be done for him. He needed to make his own mark on the lessons, give them the practical edge that Nezu as a principal just didn't have. But that unleashed the mountain, because dear God Nezu was thorough. Did all teachers have it this rough when designing their own curriculum? Yue was rather lace as fair with its method of delivering education, but the bare bones to get to that point were intense. Every single student was accounted for, but in his opinion the lessons were too broad. Some refinement would be necessary, like specific exercises with certain students acting in critical roles. Rescues was out for now, the less that the children had to even think about USJ, the better though that did leave open the option of open city combat. Many of the students in class had perfect quirks designed for combat. Though, he better make a note for ground rules, wouldn't want to have another Bakugo situation. The symbol of peace stopped in his musings as his phone rang out. A phone call is here. Thank goodness no one was around. Nidoriya. Toshinori picked up the phone on the second ring. Hey kid, how goes training? He asked, absentmindedly glancing at the clock. Quarter to ten, geez he'd been working a while. Then a thought hit him. What on earth did the kid need him for at ten at night? Actually, Midoriya stuttered, that's what I wanted to call you about. Toshinori stopped leafing through the papers. What is it? He asked. The conversation receiving his full attention caught a snag with one for all. Even through the phone, Toshinori could hear the nervous shake in the kid's voice. No, not at all. Everything's fine. He said. I just, ah, wanted to show you something. You said that I should call you whenever I had a question about one for all, and I was hoping that you could give me some advice. Unless of course you're solving a crime in which case it's really not important. Hump the brakes kid, it's alright, Toshinori said, holding back a little chuckle, I'm sitting here, bored out of my mind. Frankly you're giving me a break from all this school work and sports festival planning. Oh oh, I'm glad that I could help then. Yeah yeah, Toshinori said throwing on a jacket. Head to the beach, I'll see you there. I'll be there in a jiffy, the kid said before the line cut off. Toshinori rolled his eyes. Geez, kid must have found something if you wanted to show him of all people. Granted most kids like showing off to their idols, but All Might didn't think that's what this was about. Kid took his job as All Might's successor too seriously. His willingness to train himself into the ground was proof of that. The memory made Toshinori go pale. Oh crap, did he pull something stupid and get himself hurt again? Recovery girl was going to kill him at this rate. Toshinori moved with a speed that he didn't quite associate with his skeletal form and jumped into his truck. The drive down to the beach was quiet, eerily so. Not that his new neighborhood was bad, hell it was probably the safest end of the city. Had to be. The less people hiding and Al is ready to see him change forms, the better. It also didn't hurt that he made a point to end his routes around here when he had the chance. Having all might be known to hang around an area didn't exactly give an open invitation to criminals. No, it was more like the whole city was holding its breath for the festival tomorrow. The best and brightest showing their stuff. And Midoriya had something to show him the night before such his event. He didn't know if he should feel worried or proud. Proud felt more appropriate. Showed that the kid was making progress despite the attack. Good for him. He didn't need something like that holding him back. Toshinori pulled into the beachfront. The sands still as clear as they were when young Midoriya finished both his training and cleaning the mountain of trash. Even from the parking lot, Toshinori could see the kid, dressed in casual attire, pacing in the sands below. Climbing out, he saw that the kid was already in mutter mode. Got to imagine the egg getting cooked all over or else I could risk. Working hard kid, Toshinori asked. He was making word salad heaps to himself all over again. Young Midoriya nearly jumped out of his skin at Toshinori's arrival. Hi all. Toshinori's hand snapped over Midoriya's mouth. Not so loud kid. Toshinori shushed. Finger to his lips we've been over this. Swurry, Midoriya mumbled, eyes wide. Toshinori held in a sigh. This was going to be his whole night, wasn't it? So what was so important? You sounded like you wanted to tell something big. Oh right, Midoriya said. I I think I've got something with one for all. Toshinori raised an eyebrow, so it was a breakthrough. That was good, but what was it? He focused, giving the green-haired boy his full attention. Then Midoriya lowered into a stance, and he started to glow. Not figuratively either. Lines of raw power arched across his skin, highlighting his arms and legs, with two lines framing his face. The air around him crackled with energy, and Toshinori could feel the barely restrained power of one for all begging to be let loose. But it wasn't like the times during the entrance exam and the battle trial when Midoriya's arm was glowing like the sun, this was under control. 
harnessed, Toshinori never felt more proud of anything else in his life as a wide grin began to spread across his skeletal face. He wondered, did Nana feel like this? Looking at him, are you okay all might? Young Midoriya asked. Toshinori blinked, when had the kid stopped using his power? Well, whatever, shaking his head, Toshinori let out a small chuckle and cracked a smile. Oh yes, don't worry about me, just an old man letting his mind wander. Midoriya's shoulders slumped, you're not that old, all might. We can trade lies all day, Toshinori snorted. But I got to say, that's some progress that you've made. Looks like you're finally getting the hang of it. When did you figure this out? Jay, just today, I was brainstorming with Parker early this morning and it just clicked. Huh, well, good for him. Well, guess miracles do happen, Toshinori comments. Could you try it again? Midoriya nodded and got back to powering up. It was quicker this time, showing a degree of control that wasn't there before and right when he needed it to. Lucky him. Oh, who was he kidding? Getting a hang of one for all before when he really needed it was a godsend. Though, with his current limit he probably couldn't do a whole lot. Speaking of which, why hadn't he moved? Toshinori glanced over, and sure enough, young Midoriya was still clenched in concentration. Ah, you doing alright there Midoriya? Toshinori asked in concern. A pain-filled nod came out of Midoriya. Jay just trying to get used to it. Toshinori nodded and waited, but nothing came of it. Can you move? Midoriya looked up but it looked like it cost him his soul. I, I think so. Toshinori nodded again, so ah, uh, you gonna do that? Yes I'll, Midoriya declared. Only for a sound like a rubber band snapping occur, and for him to fall over in a huff. Toshinori winced, sand didn't look like the best benchmark. Or I'll just die, Midoriya said from the ground. Hey hey hey, Toshinori said, putting a hand on his student's shoulder, no need to go that far. It's a good start, and it shows how far that you've come. You're looking more and more like my successor every day. Midoriya looked up with watering eyes. Jeez this kid and his tear ducts. Oh god stop crying kid, you're gonna ruin the moment. Now if I were you, I'd start training with your body under this control state you got going. You've got over a week. Toshinori then grinned wide. Then you can announce I am here to the world. His successor wiped away his tears, gave a determined smile and nodded. The day before the sports festival, Peter's phone buzzed as he looked over the 3D printer in the studio as he and May were at work. Grabbing it, he checked it out. A new email. May was busy with her new babies that she was planning for the festival, while Peter was working on creating new gadgets to use on the side. He wasn't going to risk the suit he used back in Germany out in the field. Not until they got Karen out. Dear Peter Parker, According to the specifications listed in the email you provided, along with the ability of the support gear in question, it has been evaluated by the committee overlooking the UA. Sports Festival, we have given you the clear to utilize the web shooters for the event. You may only use this piece of equipment as it befits your spider quirk. If you have any questions, do not be afraid to contact us. UA, Sports Festival Evaluation Committee. Peter beamed. He saw that the 3D printer was finished as it came churning out. A refined and sleeker model of his homemade web shooters. He grabbed them and began to place them on a workbench as he began assembling the gadgets. The parts he had, combined with the studio's tools allowed him to work on it much faster than he could at home. Even if back then he had Stark brand tools. He grabbed a vial of his web formula and inserted it into the device. Putting the vial aside, Peter slapped the device onto his wrist as it slinked across, latching on and creating the spigot, trigger, cartridge, and light showing the web fluid stock. He aimed and gently activated the gadget, causing a line of web to shoot out and latch onto his thermos near the fridge. He pulled back, catching his thermos before taking a sip of water. Oh, Hatsum perked up, pausing to sip on a drink as she lifted up her goggles. She ran over, bending down to look at Peter's wrist. This is one of your babies, isn't it? You could say that. Petition came through too, so I can use this at the sports festival. He looked back up at the pinkette and grinned back at the man inventor. Hope your babies put on a good show too. He he Hatsum chuckled, hand to her bosom as she posed. My babies will make all the rich investors and companies go cuckoo for cocoa puffs. You can rest easy there. Can I see them? She wagged her finger, grinning like a fox. Ah, not until the festival. It would be a spoiler for you to see. He he the girl skipped back to her workstation, welding together some boots after putting on a protective mask. Peter grinned and looked at his web shooter on his wrist. They needed a few more tweaks, getting the right sigh in the barrels, but they were almost done. They were almost ready and it was almost time. That night, sweat dripped like a river off his brow. He could barely see the training post in front of him. But still, he thrust, he kicked, he lashed out against the unmoving wood. Sad as he was to say, there was little to no technique in it. With his right side alone, the skill set of his opponents almost didn't even matter. 
yet he needed the speed and the sudden surprising burst of movement to direct his quirk at any opportunity. Then the alarm sounded, and Shoto Todoroki dropped to the ground, only to force himself back up to his feet as fast as he could. The second he straightened, he stopped for a moment before dropping again. His arms burned, and his legs screamed for relief, but he gave no quarter. After all, he couldn't finish yet, he hadn't even started training. The alarm sounded, and Shoto thrust his right side against the dummy, flash freezing it down to the core. He pulled his hand back, looked down to his left side and held back a scoff of disgust at the shivering present there. Glancing down his family training dojo, he resigned himself to the number of dummies that stood frozen. Ten concentrated lines of ice before he began to feel the effects. He would need more. With the time that he had left, tonight would be the last time to truly push his limits. And with another dozen posts, there was no time like the present. He trotted over to the next post and reset the timer on his phone. Shoto, his sister called. Shoto held back a sigh, glancing to the edge of the field where his sister had seemingly popped out of the woodwork. Did you need something, Fayumi? His older sister scratched her cheek nervously, hesitantly glancing back. It's just, father's return from work. Shoto's narrowed. He turned his attention back to the dummy and started the countdown. So, he asked, striking at the top of the dummy. H he wanted to speak to why Fayumi jumped as the dummy was all but encased in ice. Shoto slowly turned to her, his left side shaking from something other than the cold. So, he repeated. Fayumi wilted under his gaze, and a twinge of guilt wormed its way into his chest. He turned around, stopping the timer on his phone before it could interrupt them. H he's adamant. He has legs, Shoto said bitterly, if he wants to talk, he can walk here himself. I also have ears, as much as I'm sure it pains you to hear. It took a Herculean effort not to crush his phone or freeze it at the sound of that man's voice. Turning around, he almost didn't recognize the man that stood at the door of the dojo, as much of a blessing as that would be. The old man was still in his hero uniform, but without his mask and his flaming beard. The two things that didn't change were that flat look and that judging glare as if he had the right to judge Shoto for anything. Fayumi, get dinner finished, and have your brother help. Don't wait for Shoto and I, we clearly have a lot to talk about, Endeavor said, and Shoto felt a rare spark come from his left side. He didn't even look at her as he spoke. The older hero must have seen the growing resentment, yet he simply waltzed into the dojo, experienced eyes looking over the training posts. He walked up to one, and with a single backhanded strike, shattered it into a million pieces. Shoto didn't even let himself blink at the impact, he didn't even move. Down to the core, Inji stated, and if he were anyone else, Shoto might have thought he was impressed. If you continue this foolishness, you'll only diminish the usefulness of your fire. Shoto huffed, and what a shame that would be. Unfortunately, the old man noticed. Is there a particular reason why you're insisting on this little rebellion of yours? I already told you why, Shoto all but growled. Oh yes, Enji drawled, you've made yourself quite clear. You'll be a hero only using your right side. The old hero barked out a harsh laugh, but there was no levity in his eyes. Grow up. You're not a child anymore, and all you're doing is disgracing me and your family. Besides, the old man reached into his pocket and pulled out a small slip of paper. According to your records, your mother's quirk isn't worth the respect you're giving it. The ground under Shoto froze, only stopping short of the man in front of him, the number two hero flaring his own quirk, melting the ice in an instant. His eyes burned with a heat revealing that fire, but his smarmy smile gave it a disgusting smugness that made Shoto, who glared venomously, want to vomit. What are you talking about? The youngest Todoroki demanded. Enji waved the piece of paper in his hands. Your records from UA, they reveal quite a different story than what you're telling. Shoto's clenched his fist, how the hell did he get those? The records weren't supposed to be released until after the festival at the earliest. Don't look so surprised, Enji said. Being the number two hero allows me many privileges, on top of being an alumni. After the USJ attack, I thought it prudent to check in with how you're doing, given your testimony. How considerate of you. Of course, Enji scowled. Despite what you feel, I am still your father. I have all the right to request to see the progress of my greatest creation. Shoto seethed, baring his teeth. That title, that little moniker that had been hanging over Shoto's head for as long as he could remember. The thing that made this man raise him, barely knowing he had siblings. The thing that made his mother. Shoto's eye burned, phantom memories searing through him. But even so, he didn't give the man in front of him the satisfaction of thinking that he reacted to his words. I'm in the top five for all of my classes, Shoto pointed out. Not good enough when it comes to your quirk assessment, Enji countered, nor in your mock battles. As my son, being number one is expected. 
It's the beginning of the year, Shoto said, but even he knew that was a weak argument. That's no excuse and you know it. Endeavor barked, what the hell is this? He asked waving the print in his hands, losing to a heteromorphic quirk, to a mere spider one, and a foreigner to boot. Is your rebellion really worth losing to an insect quirk? Losing to a nobody. This, Teeter Parker. He spat out the name like a curse. Shoto counted to five in his head, closing his eyes. It helped. Barely. Whatever report you got, it had to have had mentioned how I was without my partner who was neutralized first, and I was against that spider and his partner by myself. Excuses. The hero roared, as a Todoroki, my son, an entire army is fair odds when it comes to battle. All of your teachers have commented on your refusal to use your left side. You may have been getting by using your right, but you will meet a brick wall sooner or later, as your confrontation with that foreigner classmate of yours in the battle trial showed. They haven't mentioned it to me, Shoto bit back, gritting his teeth. Enji huffed, bunch of cowards, you're their student, and if you're doing something so stupid that even they notice they should inform you. At least your homeroom teacher has enough sense. According to him, your rebellion is hindering your growth in all areas. If you used it, there's no reason you shouldn't be at the top of all of your classes, if not your entire grade. Enji crushed the report into ash, letting the flakes fall to the ground, all the while keeping his stare sorely focused on Shoto. For a long moment, neither of them said a word. Shoto didn't blink under the gaze. Despite the power that his father held, this was nothing. Just a tired, bitter old man who couldn't achieve the rank of number one projecting onto a child that didn't choose to be here. And what was worse, it was at moments like these that he actually looked like he was proud of Shoto. The fact that he could meet his gaze without backing down anymore, that of all things brought some pride to Inji's eyes. That his son had a spine. However, with the festival coming up, you have an opportunity to make up for your mistakes. Shoto rolled his eyes, turning back to the posts. I don't need you to tell me to win. I was going to do that regardless. And I expect nothing less, the old man said, looking through your competition. There should be little standing in your way. However, the events of the festival are designed to hinder and challenge all quirks, even one like yours. So for now, Shoto glanced around and was met with another stack of paper, you have homework. Shoto gave the paper a half glance, only to level a flat look at the hero in front of him. And this is, the previous events for the festival, NG explained, worthless competition or not, you would do best to familiarize yourself with what could occur, to prepare for what may come. I thought you wanted me to win by myself, Shoto asked, his voice a tone that he didn't feel. I said I expect nothing less than victory from you, the old man clarified with a huff, but even I don't go into a situation blind. To do so is foolishness. Shoto's eyes narrowed and Inji only smirked. Consider this a gift, one of many that I've given you. There was a moment of complete calm as Shoto reaches out and took the offered stack of paper with his left side. He saw the cover of the paper, dating the events from when Inji himself was going through UA. As a student, a gift he had called it. Then Shoto stared right at him before willing his left side to burn the papers to ash. Enji's smoldering glare intensified, the minute pride that he had in Shoto's resolve gone like the wind. I don't need your gifts, Shoto declared, shaking his hand as he tossed away the cinders. Just like how I don't need you. So you squander it just like all the others. Enji sneered, his voice a barely restrained calm as his green eyes burned with a silent rage. He turned around, his massive grip burning his fingers into the door. The festival is the last time that you'll be allowed to continue this little rebellion of yours. Do I make myself clear? If you continue this, you will not want to see the consequences. Shoto didn't answer, but then again, they both knew that he wouldn't. So the so-called hero left, leaving Shoto alone with a slam of the sliding door. He heard Endeavor's heavy footfalls as he left this wing of the compound, not even bothering to say goodbye to his own daughter. So much for a family dinner. Good riddance. He was calm for a second, then he lashed out with a grunt, a smoking hand smashing through the closest straw dummy. Weak ice, it needed to be denser, it needed to be better. It had to be. He couldn't prove that man right. His ice would be sufficient, Shoto promised that. He was going to win the festival, no matter who stood in his way or who had the eye of the greater hero. And he would do it all without that quirk. He didn't need him. Shoto would show Endeavor that he didn't need to be present in his life. Shoto would manage on his own. Just so he could show just how worthless the old man's little desire was to him. If he had to trample over his fellow students to do it, so be it. Shoto hissed, and he fired an ice spear piercing several dummies as he about faced, visage locked in a scowl as he prepared to turn in for the night. If anyone saw him go, they would notice how the look in his eyes was just like endeavors, simmering with self-destructive fury. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 7. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.